Well, friends, a good morning to you on this uh, Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in to Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson uh, here, and boy, do we ever have a lot to talk about today. Coming up in just a couple of minutes, we're going to talk to the mayor of the town of Slave Lake, the deputy mayor as well. Uh, the two of them among those that that signed what, in my mind, at least in recent memory, is an unprecedented letter from a, a town or a city council toward that jurisdiction's elected provincial representative, their MLA, yesterday, a letter to MLA Pat Rain, who you'll you'll recognize the name, was one of those United Conservative MLAs that, that headed south for the Christmas break. He took his family to Mexico. Well, he's he's been mired in some controversy in the region as well for quite some time. There's been a growing displeasure about about his his trend toward absenteeism. Well, it finally culminated with a letter released yesterday afternoon, signed off by seven elected councillors, including the mayor, including the deputy mayor, calling for Pat Rain's resignation. Now, it gets even more interesting. He's already responded, uh, and, and basically his respond his response is is pound sand. He's like, I'm not going anywhere. He's like, I'm not resigning. We're going to find out what these two are going to do about it. The mayor and deputy mayor of Slave Lake coming up. We're also taking a look at a story making news down in Calgary. Boy, oh boy, Mayor Nahed Nenshi's entire staff, it would appear, I'm exaggerating, but two of his staff members traveled to Hawaii over the holidays. Uh, The mayor of Calgary saying they won't face sanctions. Now, now, Ned Nenshi has been kind of known in Calgary and there's been some pushback now, depending on or regardless, let me say, regardless of, of where you stand on that, there's been some pushback from folks that have said the city of Calgary has been cracking down, clamping down, locking down too much. They're saying that, you know, they point to the example of of, of the young man. I'm not going to call him the kid because he's not a kid, but the young man that was uh, threatened to be tased by police officers that was handcuffed, arrested, a, a pretty significant police response. Now, now. There's a lot to that. Let's be honest, right? People are on your social media, probably just like mine, saying, hey, in Calgary, you know, a kid gets arrested for playing hockey and the mayor's staffers are on holidays. Now, it's don't get me wrong. It's not good that the mayor's staffers were on holidays. And and quite frankly, it's probably not sufficient that there's going to be no sanction here, at least no sanction yet. We've already seen what happened at the provincial level. But let's also be clear, the kid didn't get arrested for playing hockey. Uh, I want to clarify that out of the gates. He, he was arrested for failing to cooperate with police officers and resisting arrest and, and the whole nine yards. Wouldn't give his name. We know all that. But optically, when people just read headlines, they've seen Calgary now in the headlines for two reasons when it comes to COVID over the past few weeks. Number one, that young man being arrested, playing hockey with his friends. And number two, uh, two of the mayor's staff members traveling to Hawaii, clearly contradicting the tone that the mayor and that the city of Calgary was I- endeavoring to send. I'll let you know, we do have his worship, Mayor Nahed Nenshi, confirmed to join us on Friday morning here on Real Talk, and we'll look forward to getting to that. And then there's a story, I I suppose not flying under the radar, but that's all relatively speaking right now, considering what's going on down in Georgia stateside, the World Junior Hockey Championships last night. I'm just going to say this once. There's not going to be a lot of spoiler alerts here. If you haven't seen the game yet, I don't know what to tell you, uh, but you shouldn't be watching a live broadcast the morning after, as you know. And here it is. Canada didn't. Well, we didn't win that one last night. So, so that's that's a tough one. We're going to talk to somebody who who is inside the barn. I'm actually really looking forward to a conversation with DJ Johnny Infamous. You're going to the, the DJ? Yeah, the DJ. Johnny Infamous, I work with him on the Edmonton Oilers team. He's the official DJ of your Edmonton Oilers at Rogers Place. That meant he also got to head into the NHL bubble for however many weeks that was, providing all of the ambiance, the atmosphere, the tunes, uh, trying to set the tone and the mood For these players as part of the Stanley Cup playoffs all the way up into the Stanley Cup finals. And then he returned back into the bubble as the official DJ of the World Junior Hockey Championships, including last night at the gold medal game. What a unique what a what a unique conversation we're going to have asking him. how, how How do you create an atmosphere when there are literally no fans in the stands? Johnny was quarterbacking that. And I think that's going to be a fun conversation. But to get back to the story, I think that's, you know, I think conservative leader, federal conservative leader and uh, Aaron O'Toole and, and, and Aaron O'Toole. That was a quick, that was almost that was almost a drinking game right there. That was a, yeah, Aaron O'Toole, not Andrew Shear, Aaron O'Toole uh, last night, yesterday afternoon, as a matter of fact, sending out a tweet essentially saying that until all frontline workers uh, get uh, vaccinated, get immunized, uh, no prisoner, no one incarcerated in Canada should receive the vaccine. Now, a lot of you probably, as a matter of fact, full disclosure, even including me, to a certain degree, probably go, yeah, 
I mean, okay, okay, yeah, let's talk. Sure, I mean, let's talk about it. But of course, it's the tone. It's the message it sends in sending that message out that has people buzzing. When I saw it yesterday, I didn't take a, a position on it. I didn't submit a position paper on social media, if you will. I just went, oh boy, here we go. Because it's going to get people talking about all kinds of things, including guaranteed capital punishment, the death penalty. It's going to get people talking about how we treat our prisoners. How do you measure a society's compassion? What's it, you know, uh, I've already had Bernard the Roughneck, a friend of this show, looking back and he says, hey, you remember when Ralph Klein back in the day took away all the color TVs out of the jails? That played well as, as a publicity stunt. And then he pointed to, to Sheriff Joe down in Arizona, who's who's screwed in the head of that guy but but we're gonna i'm sure have a fulsome conversation around how prisoners deserve to be treated so you get the idea there's a lot of ground to cover it's a good thing we've got some talk time today we're also by the way going to check in with a spokesperson and organizer with black lives matter edmonton if you're in alberta or if you're watching or listening from Edmonton this morning, you may be aware of an individual that claims to be affiliated with Black Lives Matter. Uh, he sought the nomination uh, for the NDP last election. That doesn't mean he was an NDP candidate, but he sought the nomination. Uh, he was ultimately defeated by Mark Charrington. Mark Charrington lost in the federal election to MP Kerry Diot, who's the conservative MP out of Edmonton here. Anyway, this individual... Essentially, I, I hate to put it this plainly, but this is what he's doing. He's cheering for, he's applauding the tragic killing of a Calgary police officer on New Year's Eve. Uh, it, it's unbelievable, as a matter of fact, what this guy's putting out there. And and the people at Black Lives Matter are going, whoa, 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 whoa. This guy's got nothing to do with us. I'm not going to sit here and speak for Black Lives Matter. They will be joining us. Sheena, Shima Robinson will be joining us on the show just about 20 minutes after 9 o'clock. Plus, an amazing feel-good story coming up. At 9.05, uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but there was a surprise visit in an Alberta classroom uh, just a short time ago over Zoom, and uh, I think you're going to get a kick out of the story. It was a story put on my radar by a Real Talk viewer, which is great. Our nation continues to grow, if you will, uh, probably due in part to the good support of the folks at Bitcoin Well, our presenting sponsor. You know, I was watching online paying attention to some of the, the commentary around Bitcoin. And, you know, you talk to advocates of crypto and they'll say, well, we've been telling you this for years. You should, I mean, you should, you know, Adam O'Brien, the founder of Bitcoin Well, has a new clothing line that just says, told you so. <laughs> Backers of Bitcoin have been saying for a long time, hey, there's a lot of room for this to grow. And some pretty bullish prognostications on the year to come as they say, this is the new gold. Uh, so, hey, who knows what the ceiling looks like? If you'd like to make sense of crypto, you want to get in the game, you don't even know what I'm talking about, but you'd like to learn more. Look to the team at Bitcoin Well. Just follow the sponsors link at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. All right. Well, this is a pretty remarkable story. A, a letter released yesterday posted publicly to the member of the Legislative Assembly, the elected representative of Lesser Slave Lake, Pat Rain. It's it's from the council of the town of Slave Lake, and it's signed off by seven uh, elected representatives, including the mayor of the town of Slave Lake, Tyler Warman, uh, the deputy mayor, Councillor Sean Gramlich, and five others. It calls for the resignation of Pat Rain. I mean, it's a scathing letter. If you've seen it online, you already know. Uh, they go on to say it's become clear. And keep in mind, I mean, I, I hate to I hate to paint jurisdictions like this, but the fact of the matter is we're talking about Slave Lake, uh, Jusard, High Prairie. If you know the area, first of all, stunningly beautiful region, wonderful people. Uh, number two, um, well, OK, number two, number one really is probably the best walleye fishing in Alberta. That's number one. Number two, wonderful people. Number three. It's conservative country. Okay, so we want to take this with a grain of salt. As a matter of fact, we're going to get into that. These aren't a bunch of people that have been hating on the United Conservatives and picking fights with the government for two years. Okay, so it's important we know the context here. The letter goes on to basically say it's become clear the hard work that you put into campaigning for the position of MLA has not continued since being elected. We have several grievances with your performance. They say we seem to be making little progress. We voiced our concerns. You know, all of this is 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 absent 
absenteeism at play. In conclusion, we have an MLA that does not represent the people of this region. They're calling for his resignation. Let's find out what led to this dramatic development. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program the mayor of the town of Slave Lake, Tyler Warman, the deputy mayor, Councillor Sean Gramlich. Gentlemen, thanks for being here and a good morning to you. Welcome to Real Talk. Guys, I think, yeah, just make sure you, you unmute your microphones there. Mayor, uh, Mayor Warman, we'll go with you first. Uh, this, this, is, this is obviously uh, a huge story. Uh, whether or not people know much about the town of Slave Lake, and they're going to learn more here in the next 20 minutes or so, uh, I would imagine that this decision to publicly call for the resignation of your MLA wasn't made lightly. What pushed you to this point, Mayor? You know, I, I think, uh, yeah, and I want to highlight that this was not taken lightly. This is not a, a political stunt. This is not a media stunt. Uh, this is a desperation, frustration play. And so I will say that, um, you know, we, we had a candidate that uh, came in, took up residence just prior to the election. Uh, we knew they had business interests in, in this country and, and in the U.S., uh, but basically said, hey, I've got that covered. Somebody's going to look after that. I'm here. You know, I've done business in this region before. I'm living here. I want to represent you. Uh, and I'm here to work. And, um, you know, election came and that was over. And all of a sudden uh, that person is hard to get a hold of and they're not here. And uh, we have meetings that get missed. We have uh, ministers that come to town. Our MLA doesn't show up. Um, and the frustration grows and grows and grows. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, in, in fairness, we we confronted Mr. Wren about this. We we sent him stuff in in writing. We had our our some members of our council sit down and and tell him this personally to his face, uh, and just say like, listen, things things are not working here. This is not the way that this is supposed to to, to work. You're here to represent the people of this region, um, and this isn't about the party. This isn't about the government. This is the fact that we have a, a representative who basically is not here, is not engaged, doesn't know what's going on, um, doesn't listen, and doesn't seem to care. And so. Uh, it is obvious to our residents that his passion is not in this job. Let somebody else who is or wants that job and can do that job to look after us because we deserve it. So, Deputy Mayor, this is this is not a, a knee jerk uh, response to to MLA Reign's recent trip to Mexico. I mean, was that was that sort of the straw that broke the camel's back? I think it was uh, it just highlighted some of the stuff we've been lacking, the uh the ignorance that you are above this region, above these people, that you'll decide to go on this trip. Um, a very insincere apology, but that was just the icing on the cake. Tyler highlighted a number of other issues that were leading up to this, and uh, the, the stars just aligned for the timing issue of when this came out. Uh, we've been talking about something like this for weeks, if not months, and trying to help Pat and trying to guide him and work with him, and we, we've just, uh, it's falling upon deaf ears, and now we're at this moment. Uh, Mayor, I, I I think I think it's worth pointing out. My understanding is that you're actually quite involved with the United Conservative Party in the region. Can you clarify? Is it, am I understanding correct? Are you actually on the board of the constituency association there? I mean, my, I guess what I'm getting at is, didn't to a certain degree, didn't both of you actually help Mr. Rain get elected? Well, I think I think as a mayor, I have to be neutral. But uh, yeah, no, I'm a I'll be honest, I. I'm a UCP card carrying person and, and I've been a supporter of them for all, you know, many of my life and, and continue to be. Um, once again, like I said, this isn't, this isn't about party, but yeah, I, I think the message that Mr. Rain needs to get, like this is UCP country um, as is evident from the election. And many of our people on our council, many of our people in our community helped get him here. And these are the same people that are saying, Hey, listen, you, you committed to do something and you're not doing it. And we've had enough. And, you know, we're not six months past the election here. I get that there's a huge learning curve. I get that stuff goes on. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is almost two years later. And I, I want to speak to the travel issue. The travel issue is, is one of it. But, you know, one of the things that compounds and even highlights it even worse for us, you know, we appreciate the premier taking disciplinary action on the people that traveled and basically, you know, snubbed us and um, said this is no big deal. Um, but, you know, he actually has less involvement in the government now. He has less responsibility in the government he has less interaction with the government and you know we're looking at that thinking you know we thought it was bad now we're actually gonna go backwards here yeah uh sean let me ask you this uh on on pat rain's official facebook page uh he posted about 15 hours ago a response uh to this letter calling for his resignation and he basically said it talks about why he believes that he was elected 
Um, he throws a couple hand grenades at the NDP talking about the carbon tax. He says he's helped eliminate that carbon tax. He says he's cut a significant amount of red tape. Um, he's created a more competitive environment for business. He says, yeah, I made some poor choices around travel. He says, you know, yeah, I, I do continue to own businesses in the States and travel there. He says, but I will continue representing Lesser Slave Lake, the region I love and call home. So he basically told you guys to pound sand. As I said earlier, he basically said he's not going anywhere. What's your response to, to his post that, uh, by the way, has about a thousand comments, none of them flattering? I, I my response is what, what's going to change. So now he's going to keep representing to us, representing us vacantly still. Like we, we, we threw ourselves out in the limb here. We weren't getting the representation we wanted before. We gambled and thought, hey, we'll throw some heat on him right now. We're probably not going to get the representation after. So I'm not sure it even matters if he wants to keep representing us. Doors open at the town of Slave Lake if you want to show up and actually do some work, but I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Yeah, but Mayor, let's be honest. I mean, the the relationship uh, now is completely dysfunctional. Uh, when you have, I mean, correct me. Sorry, I know I should have this in front of me, but there are seven signatures on that page. Um, there are eight elected councillors, including yourself, Mayor. Correct. So it's not it's not or or is this unanimous? This yeah, is a unanimous letter. This is this is this has to be unprecedented. Uh, I can't see. I don't, know, I don't know if it's been done before. <laughs> I don't. I, I can't think of it. I can't. I, I certainly can't think of a time in Alberta when a when a, a city or town council has unanimously called for the resignation of its MLA or its MP. Uh, so, so mayor, you know, you you talk about your, and I don't want to keep put, putting you in a corner and pigeonholing you or anything like that. But, but I appreciate your disclosure. I think it it, it adds to the depth of our conversation. You saying that, yeah, you're a supporter of, of conservative parties in Alberta, typically have been. Um, something like this, at a time like this, was there some debate over how this might play? Did you, did, did you potentially consider some of the ramifications that, that could roll out uh, with regards to the municipality and its relationship with the government of Alberta? Where are you at on that? Well, I think our council doesn't take any of our decisions lately with respect, but I will say, um, yeah, you know, there's a big fear about what the provincial government is going uh, to say and what they're going to do. And that's why I continue to say this isn't about the provincial government. This isn't about NDP or UCP. This is about representation. You know, we elected a person to be our advocate um, and, uh, you know, and speak up for our region and fight for our region and fight for our people. Um, you know, and his response that he had yesterday is a prime example of the fact that, you know, this is this is out of the provincial newsletter from a year ago. Um, this is my accomplishments um, that doesn't talk about anything that he's doing for the region that doesn't talk about anything that he's doing for our people and shows just how disengaged he is there. And, you know, all you got to do is look at those thousand comments that are under that are that have come out in less than 24 hours and know that, you know, this isn't a town council thing. This is a. This is a regional thing that we're just we're we're conveying what our region is telling us. There's uh, I mean, there's an incredible amount of of animosity in the comments, which which uh, to me uh, is really I mean, it says a lot. You can tell that the locals have been ticked off uh, for a long time. I want to say even anecdotally, anecdotally, let me be clear. But I was lucky enough to visit your neck of the woods this summer. It's one of our family's favorite places to visit. Uh, as mentioned, uh, out of Jusard, we, we did some, some, some fabulous fishing and had a wonderful time up there. But I'll tell you what, uh, it, was, it was really neat at that time uh, to see so many people that were engaged politicos, people that had listened to my radio show, people that, that knew who I was and wanted to talk casual politics. And there was this recurring theme. Back, I don't remember what month it was. Maybe it was August. Uh, people, ca every person, like I'm serious, every person that came up to me said, "Hey, there's this political story here. You got to cover this political story." Our MLA, he like doesn't even live here. He, he's he's down in Texas. Like he's literally never here. So anecdotally, let me tell you what happened. So later in the evening, I crossed paths with the guy, and I happened to have an opportunity. So I'm talking to him for like five, ten minutes. And I'm picking his brain a little bit about government and picking his brain about. And he finally says, so what's your deal? What do you do? What's your story? Who are you? And I went, oh, boy, like <laughs> this that just said to me, the guy doesn't have a hot clue what's going on in Alberta politics right now. Sean, have you been hearing that from your constituents? I mean, the, the, the rumblings. I mean, I, I heard it you know, from the horse's mouth, essentially. But but about living and working out of Texas. I mean, what's been the word on the street about your MLA? It's been almost since day one. We've been hearing this feedback. 
and uh, take everything with a grain of salt. Tyler mentioned learning curve. Everyone's getting their feet wet, but it's gone too far. And uh, I, I'm not sure that the one bedroom he rented off a guy who rented a house, I'm not even sure if he holds that as a residency anymore. Like I think he's been, I think he's completely not living in Slave Lake at all. I, I, I don't know when the last time he was here. It might've been at that event you were at Ryan. So he's very vacant for meetings. He, he skips the meetings over the phone, over the Zooms, his office, does the best they can to try to keep him lined up, but it, the, it's not working out for a region. And that's where this all comes from. And uh, we've, we've been hearing it loud and clear for two years, but we've been trying to work behind the scenes to make it work. And it's just not working anymore. Uh, got some interesting comments from, from some viewers here. Wayne says at first glance, I actually really didn't like what slave lakes council did. Uh, but the more that I think about it, I would have signed that letter too. It takes courage but it was the right thing to do. That from Wayne, who's who's watching in. So where does this go from here? Uh, you call for, I mean, it, it makes province-wide, and, and I've even seen it reported in Eastern Canada. I mean, it's technically national news, this story. Uh, it's part of, obviously, a bigger story right now, this government in turmoil. The MLA has already responded and said he's not going anywhere. So, Mayor, what's the plan? I mean, are you going to initiate conversations with the Premier's office? Are you just going on business as usual without the support you expect from your MLA? What happens now? Well, I, I think a couple of things there. So first off, we, we didn't feel like we were getting much support. So, it, you know, when we did this, we didn't think we had much to lose. Yeah. Theoretically, if we have someone that doesn't show up to the meetings and doesn't return calls. And, you know, our last meeting with him was basically, you know, this list just keeps getting longer, Mr. Wren, because nothing comes off of it. Um, and, and I want to stress, too, like the things that we asked for are, are, are all provincial mandated things or the things we don't even have control over, our provincial parks, our hospitals, our roads. Uh, we'd fix them ourselves if it was in our mandate, but we can't. So... Uh, we need an advocate to do that. Um, to cut Tyler off quickly, Ty, this, some of the things we're asking for, we have solutions for to boot. We're we're offering them up three different options for problem A, and we're we're getting nowhere with it. So we're not just the the council or the municipality that's whining and beating our hands on a desk saying we need this. We're offering up solutions to Pat and his government, and it's falling on deaf ears. Yeah, no, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. And so you know, as we move forward, you know, we can't force Pat to step down. The premier can't even technically do that. Um, that's the way democracy works. Um, but in reality, um, I think it's, there comes a point too where our council becomes uncomfortable covering for someone for, you know, to say, oh yeah, well, this, you know, the meeting got delayed or, you know, we just didn't hear what we needed to hear. So we're going to keep working on that or doing whatever. And we're getting questions where we start to look silly. Um, and in fairness, that's not what we were elected to do. That's not what we're required and requested to do. So it's important to say, hey, like, listen, this this is not working and we're not standing on that hill with you. We tried. We gave you notice. We tried to be there for you. Um, you're not interested. Your your most recent post just, you know, basically flips us the bird and says, hey, I'm going to do whatever I want. And, and in fairness, he has that right. We are urging him uh, as people who do care about this region it is obvious you don't move aside. Let somebody else do it. This is I'm reading the comments like it's I, I'm sorry, but a politician. I mean, I should be careful what I say because politicians have recovered from some pretty remarkable disasters before. But but and we are politicians, too. So yeah, yeah, you guys are politicians, too. But but I, I'll tell you, I mean, I would imagine, uh, you know, what's what what there are so many uh, compelling and fascinating angles to this story. I mean, it's 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 like to state the obvious again. This is worth reiterating. Th these aren't political opponents that are calling for for uh, an elected representative's head. The are, these are the people that knocked doors for him, that raised funds for him, that helped him get elected, that are calling for him to resign, not even halfway into the mandate. And I don't think that this is a recoverable position uh, for this MLA. I cannot imagine, I cannot envision a scenario where he recovers from this. And so then what does that mean? That means that the people in this region right now are, are going to be feeling underrepresented. I will state the obvious. I would suggest that you've pulled a pretty astute move on your part because you've sent a very clear message to your constituents that this is on our radar. We know you're not happy. We're working on solutions. We're having a difficult time getting through to the government. Um, I would suspect at some point with continued applied pressure that this situation will resolve itself and Pat Rain will not. I mean, put it this way. Nobody's signing the guy's nomination papers if he tries to run again in 2023. I'll tell you that much. W would you agree? I mean, is that is that the safest statement I've made all day, Sean? Yeah, 100%. And uh elaborate a bit on you said that he's vacant 
when we make a decision at the town council level, we got to go to the local grocery store and hear about it from your in-laws, your neighbors, and be accountable for the decisions we make. If our uh, MLA is never here, there's no accountability. He's not answering the phone calls or emails from his constituents, so he has no accountability. And and if you're if you're not feeling the heat from your residents, you 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 don't care. So if you're down in Texas and you you get an email, you look at it, you delete it, you don't answer the question. You're not representing this region we, we, the way we deserve, the way we need to be represented. Mayor, I, I would suggest that if you wanted to focus on something uh, to put in front of the premier, it would probably be, be for him to honor his promise to bring in recall legislation. The United Conservatives on the campaign trail promised that if an MLA broke the public trust, Albertans would have an opportunity to fire their MLA. Is that something that's on your mind or on your radar? Well, it has been for months, to be honest. We've kind of been waiting for it. Um, I think our region has been waiting for it. We would be the first ones to line up and, and give it a try, I think. Um, you know, this, this isn't like, like I said, this, this feeling, this relationship, this, this isn't new. Like this is what our people have been feeling for months upon months upon months. So, uh, the fact that that recall legislation still isn't here, um, and our, our MLA just doesn't seem to get how bad it is. Like it just doesn't seem to resonate with him. The, the loss of trust, the, the accountability issues, the absentee issues, uh, and the fact that our council is done being quiet about it, um, like, this would be the perfect example for recall legislation. But right now, this is our only option because that doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Uh, Tyler Warman is a Slave Lakes mayor. Sean Gramlick is Slave Lakes deputy mayor. Uh, yesterday, they were two of seven signatories to a letter calling for their MLA's resignation. A remarkable story. Gentlemen, thanks for doing this. We appreciate your time. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us on, Ryan. Have a good day. Yeah, you bet. You too. Uh, this is uh, interesting comments on our live YouTube thread here. Uh, you know, Samira says, I I've heard from some people in Slave Lake that Daniel Larive uh, was the best MLA, but they voted her out solely because she was NDP. That's ridiculous, says Samira. Uh, I mean, politicians get voted out all the time based on their party affiliation, right? Um, I, I don't know why. I'm, I, why am I right now thinking of Lori Blakeman? It just right now, Lori Blakeman just popped into my mind of a politician that that got screwed over in her case, not screwed over. That's not fair because it was a Democratic election. But my point is, if you don't know Lori Blakeman, she was an Alberta liberal that was very popular in I believe Edmonton Center was her riding. Uh, it's where David Shepard is the MLA now. And in 2015, when that when that orange wave hit Alberta, a couple of pretty popular MLAs uh, were sent packing. And among them, you know, as a, as a result, I think of either their affiliation with the progressive conservatives or just the fact that they weren't NDPers. And Lori Blakeman, you always kind of, I don't know, you kinda, I, at least for me, I always sort of took it for granted. Like it was like, you know, they'll run strong campaigns against her, but she's just so popular. She's going to have a she'll have a seat in the Alberta legislature, you know, in opposition uh, as part of t typically, you know, it's not the early 1990s. I'm getting off on a tangent now, but we're not talking Lauren uh, Lawrence Decor and, and you know, uh, Kevin Taft anymore. We're, we're talking the new Alberta liberals, which really now is just a, a smoldering campfire over in the corner. But the point being, Lori Blakeman lost her seat. And it had nothing to do with that she was Lori Blakeman. It had to do with the fact she wasn't NDP in 2015, right? Some people speculating Lori Blakeman will be named a Canadian senator, by the way. Mark wonders, could Daniel Larry Vey win if she ran again? Who knows? I mean, the, the sense I get from those two, and, and no riding is ever solidified. Um, Pearl Callahan was the MLA in that riding for a long time, very popular with the progressive conservatives. Um that, this is a writing that could go either way. You never know based on the strength of the candidates, et cetera. Uh, Terrell is is what, responding to Pat Rain says, you know, a name on a lease doesn't mean you physically reside here. You know, it says it may have been the honor of a lifetime for you, which is how he's described his political career with the United Conservatives, says, but you have dishonored those you represent. You know, be honorable and step down. Julie says the Council of Slave Lake has asked you to resign. You need to represent the people and do what they have asked. What does it mean when you say you take full responsibility for your poor choices? From what I've seen so far, all the traveling MLAs have come out and said they're sorry they take responsibility, but there are no actions, just hollow words, and a promise to work to regain the trust. We don't want you to work to regain the trust. Too little, too late, resign. That from Julie in the area. I mean, there, there are literally a thousand comments. That's just on Rain's, that's just on MLA Rain's Facebook page. That's not even what you're saying to us. I mean, we could go on all day just on this. You know, Leanne says if it was an NDP MLA, they wouldn't be using words like covering for him. They'd be threatening that person. Right. Others are saying, hey, listen, 
You know, I mean, uh, if I can paraphrase, there are a lot of comments. You can read them yourself on our YouTube thread. People are saying, hey, Slave Lake, you made this bed. You can lay in it. Some people are unsympathetic to this. Terry says, why do people still support this party when it's obvious the lack of caring about people? It's, it's evident across the province. This is not an isolated issue. Scott says recall legislation. What, what are you guys even talking about? The, that page on the United Conservative Party's website has been scrubbed. It's like it never existed, just like Slave Lake's United Conservative representation. It is true. The United Conservatives did pull down. They did pull down the part of their website that had the promise about recall legislation. They did. And also, let's just say recall legislation is not a silver bullet. Number one, we, we heard from an NDP MLA, Rocky Pancholi, who was on the committee. It, it was a, a, a UCP loaded committee, which is their right. They're the majority government. They can do what they want. Majority governments do that. But the committee was, for all intents and purposes, a UCP majority committee. So in other words, they're going to get what they want with regards to what they put in front of their colleagues. But Racky said, don't get your hopes up about recall legislation. She says, I participated in the process. They're going to make it virtually impossible for an MLA to be recalled, which I actually personally don't think is the worst thing in the world. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm really a huge fan of recall legislation. On the surface, it looks great. On the surface, hey, man, you mess around with us. We will get your ass out of there way before the next election. Do not take us for granted. We are the people. The people have the power. In theory. But a lot of people that have a bit of experience in politics will say, keep in mind that recall legislation is also remarkably effective in a party holding it over its uh, potential dissident MLA's heads, right? In other words, you even think about crossing the floor, you even think about leaving caucus to sit as an independent, you even think about any of these shenanigans, and we will mobilize our army in your riding, and you will be recalled pronto, right? It's actually a, a great mechanism for party control and compliance with a government, with a leader like Jason Kenney that sort of seems to be his style. I mean, you know, prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. So curious for your take on that. Look at this. Now, we want to get to this story. Obviously, it's a big story making news. We haven't even really, in fulsome fashion, talked about Mayor Nahed Nenshi and his staff. If Chief of Staff heading down to Hawaii, Mayor says there will be no consequences for that. I'm not sure about that. We'll see what develops over the next little bit. Aaron O'Toole talking about prisoners and, and vaccines, and there are a whole bunch of other stories. Let's give a shout out to a couple of our sponsors this morning that we're really excited to be working with, and, and that includes new members of our team of builders. We're excited to welcome Kubi Energy to the fold. Uh, some of you are already submitting your your videos, your photos, your stories. Uh, Kubi Energy is going to be rolling out. We're doing. We're officially unveiling it next Monday. They're rolling out. A, it's like a moment of positivity. That's not what it's called. We want to save the reveal for next Monday. But it's going to be a positive focus on Mondays presented by Kubi Energy. So we want to hear your stories. We want to hear about the little kids lemonade stand or we want to actually, can you do lemonade stands in a pandemic? Maybe not. Maybe not. Well, whatever your neighbors and friends, family are doing to keep things positive. We want to hear the stories. We want to see the photos. We want to see the videos that made you laugh. Oh, we might, you can do curbside pickup. You could do drive through lemonade. Drive through lemonade. Curb. Yeah. Well, I guess lemonade's it's always been curbside it's pickup. It's always been curbside. It is curbside yeah. pickup. What else is it if not curbside pickup? Absolutely. That's a great point. Were you ever a lemonade stand guy? Absolutely. Yeah. What did I, you charge for a glass? Do you remember? Uh, this is where we get now. Kubi Energy is going to be like, you're going to talk about our business? We yeah, will. Probably. Just, just give us a second. Uh, I want to say anywhere from like 50 cents to a dollar. I remember when I was a kid, my mom was like, charge a loony because it's a round amount and everybody's got it's one. It's a round on amount. And, and everybody's yeah. kid, kids devalue their own. Like kids haven't yet realized. Well, some of them have the real smart ones. But how to capitalize on that cuteness factor, right? Like, how, how much is the lemonade, little little lad? Uh, it's $5. And then you're like, five bucks? But, like, who's going to say no? You're not going to be like, you're not going to be like, that's ridiculous. Oh, you're going to pay the five bucks, right? Hey, four glasses of lemonade. You got 20, you got a new Hot Wheels set, kiddo. Anyway, Kubi Energy is going to keep our focus on all things positive on Monday mornings, which means that we need your submissions, your photos, your videos, your great news stories. Just title Kubi Energy, K-U-B-Y, in the subject line on your emails to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Kubi is locally owned and operated. They're in the solar game. They're, they're head office in Edmonton, but they've got a BC office in Kamloops. 
So in other words, you know, you've got properties, you've got friends in BC that are looking to go solar. This is a great go-to. Their employees, all of them installing solar systems are certified electricians and they're employing certified tradespeople in Alberta and BC. This is important. I don't think, you know, running solar up on your roof, you always hear folks saying that they're going to do it they're gonna like DIY. They're going to watch a YouTube video and then install. Oh, I've own. thought about it. Oh, it's I, yeah. No offense. And you're a smart guy and you're a talented guy. You're an engineer, but I, I, I still am not going to do it, but I've thought it just, about it. Yeah, I think I think it's probably better to it's probably better to hand it off to the pros, to the certified electricians that aren't going to start your house on fire. That's my text, not Kubi Energy's text. You can find them online at kubienergy.ca. That's K-U-B-Y energy dot C-A. Also, a big shout out before we move on to Grand Dog Essentials. Uh, Grand Dog Essentials is quality raw dog food, a family owned business with two generations working together. They do doorstep delivery. It's the finest raw dog food on the market. It's frozen in 40-pound boxes. They drop them off in Metro Edmonton, Calgary, and the Red Deer area. And all I need to tell you is this. Our dogs have been eating grand dog food for the last number of years. It's incredible quality product, and I believe in them personally, and I'm proud to endorse Grand Dog Essentials. You can order online at granddog.ca. You can find them on all the social media channels. And get this, if you use the discount code REALTALK on their website, REALTALK, you'll get 10% off your first-time order. Very cool to be partnering up. We're thrilled to welcome Grand Dog Essentials to the fold. All right, let's get to this. Now, this this would actually qualify. This is a great news story. This is very cool. We'll get back to, to, to... rage and anger and and unrest and scandal and double standards and hypocrisy in a moment but right now let's just focus on a story that absolutely warmed our hearts allison palmer is a grade six teacher at victoria school uh, for the arts in edmonton uh zoe cogger is a student at victoria school of the arts and we're thrilled that both of them have been able to make time for us this morning allison and zoe good morning to both of you and welcome to real talk morning zoe we're giving you we're giving you a break from your schoolwork here this is this is a pretty exciting i hope but this is not this is far from the most exciting thing that you've experienced this week i think when it comes to zoom meetings that you've participated in who did you just have a chance to chat with uh well yesterday we talked to the prime minister (laughs) The prime minister. So you don't you don't mean that you and your class loaded up a YouTube video and and you watched a video of the prime minister. You're you're talking about a conversation that you had live in person with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Kind of. I mean, it wasn't really in person. I mean, nothing really has been lately. But yeah. <laughs> oh, good point. So so there. This is you had a chance. Uh, your whole class to hear from the prime minister, uh, Allison. This is a really really wonderful story. How did this come about? Can you tell us how this happened? Well, it's a story of how Twitter can actually sometimes be a magical place. It's not always a horrible place. (laughs) And it all happened through Twitter that I happened to uh, share a tweet of Rosemary Barton's of a cute little picture of Justin Trudeau's youngest son uh, peeking through the window in one of his press conferences. And then that led to Katie Telford, his chief of staff, liking my retweet. And then I just asked her on Twitter if we could meet the prime minister and she made it happen. And she didn't have to do that. But she did, and it turned into just the best day. I saw that you're, and this is this is pretty funny because uh, you had you had simply noted that it was cute, as you said, the photo that Rosie Barton posted. You said that's cute, and you, and and you laughed yourself on Twitter. You said it got three likes, which which isn't a ton, but what was important was that one of the three was the prime minister's chief of staff who who made this happen. I thought what what was also kind of cute, if you don't mind me using the word, was your request where you basically said. I know it's not happening. I know it's not happening, but I have to ask, how surprised were you that it did happen? Oh, when she replied, I couldn't believe it. It was so exciting. And she replied with DM me. We'll see what we can do. So I DM'd her, but I was very like, oh, thank you for replying. You, you didn't have to. And I, I don't expect this to happen. Don't worry if it doesn't. And and I wanted to prove that I was, you know, a real person. So I was like, my name is Allison Palmer. And I teach at Victoria School of the Arts and this is my work email address and, and I'm I'm legitimate. And then I just thought maybe I'll never hear anything again. And she got back to me. She replied with, 
uh, we will follow up. He loves doing class visits. And then I didn't hear anything for about three weeks. So I was starting to lose hope, but it all came true. <laughs> Well, hey, Allison, I'm going I'm to give you credit. I'm going to give you a shout out because we've been trying to get the prime minister for six weeks and it took you like six hours to get him. So so congratulations there. So, Zoe, how did how did this go? Did you have can you explain to us? Did you, you and your classmates have an opportunity to ask the prime minister questions? Uh, what sort of questions did you ask him? Well, basically what happened is he wanted to know what it's like for average families during the pandemic. And so three of us got to tell him, including me, what it's been like during the pandemic. And then a bunch of us got to kind of ask some questions. Um, and that's kind of what happened. Did you have a chance to ask him a question? And if so, what did you ask him? Well, I was one of the three students who got to kind of explain what it's been like during the pandemic. Um, and I didn't really ask a question because I thought, well, I already got to tell the prime minister how my life has been. So, <laughs> well, what did that, uh, first of all, you strike me as, uh, remarkably, uh, what, what's the word I want to use? Mature, compassionate, intuitive. Um, th how cool is that, that you had a chance to engage, uh, with the PM, but also uh, an opportunity Zoe to, to inform him about things, about the perspective of, of a grade six student in Alberta that could have some sort of influence or impact on government policy. What did that mean to you to be able to speak with him directly, to have an audience with the leader of Canada's federal government? I thought it was definitely a big thing. Um, I thought it was definitely something I could kind of sneak vaccine talk into because that is something that I have really been thinking about lately because I do kind of want to be able to get used to in-person school before I start on like junior high. So a vaccine for people who are under 16 would be very nice. <laughs> Hey, Zoe, uh, you are informing me now. I'm embarrassed to say I don't actually know the details on that. So so can you bring me and our audience up to speed now? Is there no, I know I should know this, but I don't. Uh, is there no vaccine for people under the age of 16? Is that right? Yes, currently. Well, the first, I think, three vaccines had only been tested for people who are 18 or older, and there's still quite a few groups that they might not be effective or like they might not be compatible with. But currently there are no approved vaccines for people who are under the age of 16, because recently there has been an approved vaccine for people 16 and up, but it's still not less than 16. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually just reading, trying to get up to speed quickly on this now. Look what you're doing. You're you're educating an entire audience this morning right now. We're grateful that you showed up here, Zoe. Um, Allison, I'm, I'm starting to get a sense of, of maybe why we've tapped her on the shoulder to be part of this interview. I, I suspect that we're, we're, we're in the midst of a leader of today and tomorrow, as we say. Um, what questions did your did your students have for the PM? What, aside from vaccines, which, which to me is telling in so many ways that this is this is on these young learners heads and hearts and this is their priority. What else did they have questions about? Well, we started off, you know, nice and easy. We started with questions like, what made you want to be prime minister? And, um, you know, what's your favorite part about it? What do you not like about it? How do you balance being an MP for the people of Papineau as well as being the prime minister? And then we got into the harder questions. So we asked about how his government plans to meet the Paris Accord, what, uh, why did they choose to work on banning single-use plastics? Why have they not lifted all the boil water advisories, which was a major promise of their 2015 platform? We asked about oh, pharmacare and when we might see in uh, a national pharmacare program. And uh, then we finished off by asking him if he has a dog. And he does not. He has two guinea pigs. Uh, so so th these are tough questions. I mean, there, there. As as my buddy Laws says, there were you didn't come here to tipsy toe in the tulips, Zoe. Oh no, uh, no, oh, no, definitely not. Yeah. So, did you have an opportunity, Zoe, as well? I would imagine uh, for either yourself or one of your classmates to to explain to the prime minister uh, the impact that this isolation has had on you. I mean, you talk about really wanting to get back to in-person classes for junior high. That would be so big. Um, we've got a little guy. He's, he's younger than you. 
Um, he's doing kindergarten online. We're hoping the same thing for him, that his grade one experience will be able to be in person in school. What sort of an impact has this last nine months or so had on you, Zoe? Well, um, my best friend and I used to walk to school together every day. I mean, we don't live too far from each other and we're pretty close to our school. So that's nice, but I haven't, I, I don't even do in-person school anymore. So that's definitely not going to happen for a while. And I used to do a lot of extracurriculars, which I only can do, I think, two of them now. So it has definitely had a big impact between a large variety of subjects. Um, not easy. How about for yourself, Allison, as a, as a teacher? Like, obviously, this would be, this would be uh, present its own unique challenges for, for educators in so many different ways. Um, it looks to me like you're, you're chiming in this morning from your classroom. Is that correct? You are in the classroom today. And you, do you yes. have, you, you, you will have students back on January 11th. Is that accurate? No. So the group of kids that I have in grade six this year, they chose online from the oh, very okay. beginning. And I volunteered to be an online teacher for the year. So we've been together since September online. So this week of at, at online is like, that's just what we do. So yeah. we've been doing that all year. So we're still online at home. And um, I have been coming into school because I don't own a computer. <laughs> so what? I couldn't even work from home. And I would rather be at school anyway if I can. If it gets to the point where everything really shuts down and I have to stay home, I guess I'll have to. I had a laptop, Ryan, but my cat knocked <laughs> a glass of red wine all over the um, keyboard and it broke and I haven't replaced it because I never, I, I didn't really need it yeah. until we went online. So I'm glad I had it in the spring cause I did work from home, but uh, yeah, that's why <laughs> I come to school. <laughs> that's such a great <laughs> pandemic. That's, that's just like, it, it sounds like a lead up to a joke, except it's not, you know, like I had a laptop, my cat spilled red wine on the keyboard and here we are, but, um, oh, that's absolutely amazing. So Zoe, what's hey listen, you've got, you've got like, by the time this is all said and done later today, you're going to have thousands of people that are going to have watched this interview. Thousands of people will have downloaded this podcast and I guarantee you among them are going to be a whole bunch of of young students, young learners, kids in elementary, junior high, and high school, whose parents are going to say, you have to hear this story about the students that got to talk to the prime minister. I'm putting you on the spot here, Zoe. What's your message? What's your message to all the other students that are going to be watching right now? Do you have a massive message of encouragement uh, for people that are heading into either going back to school or heading into a new year and, and I guess trying to keep their wits about them? Well, definitely social distance, uh, especially if you're in person. Uh, <laughs> but for anybody who's online, I definitely recommend, especially for your teachers, doing things like what Ms. Palmer has with trying to get especially like local, like very important people. And I think it's really helped online learning because in the spring, we only had two subjects and occasionally a project for another but it didn't really mean anything for our marks. It was just like, you can do this. Um, we got marks on the assignment sometimes, but it didn't do anything for a report card. Like it was just something like, you don't have the subject. So like, here's an extra thing, I guess. Yeah. But now it's so much better because we, we basically have all of our subjects. And I think keeping them fun like this is a very good way to to like teach this kind of stuff. I don't have a lot of advice for in-person learners because I have done online the whole year. Um, I would be the one that would probably ask for advice from in-person people because if I am able to go in person for the last bit of the year, it would be nice. <laughs> So, Zoe, do you have uh, the, the people that are watching right now on our YouTube channel? People are talking about uh, you as an example of the bright promise of tomorrow. Um, people are talking about uh, students like you uh, as a reminder that the future is promising and that we have leaders that are coming up after us. Uh, quite frankly, Zoe, to use my words, to fix our mess. And we apologize in advance for that. But we're grateful that what you're going to do for us, because we're all going to be in long-term care centers and retirement homes when people like you are leading the country. Do you have any aspirations 
to get into politics. Did yesterday's chance encounter with the prime minister plant a seed within your mind? Have you been thinking about that or, or do you have other big dreams? I almost had a bit of a seed before that, actually. So it kind of helped it germinate, I guess. Okay, well, there we go. That's pretty exciting. Uh, that, that's got to be music to your ears, Allison. Not that you're cultivating and grooming young politicians, but that uh, uh, reaching out uh, something, swinging at a pitch on Twitter uh, led to an experience that students like Zoe obviously are never going to forget. Yeah. I, I, what we're doing is we're maybe not politicians, but we are certainly uh, helping the future leaders to develop. And there's leaders in every part of our society whether they're in politics or working behind the scenes, like the other wonderful people we connected with in Ottawa and people, well, and I'll just throw in a little plug for Zoe's family and her dad, who's a bus driver and out there working every day for people in Edmonton and and her mom, who's a teacher as well. And there's leaders everywhere. So I, I'm very confident that Zoe is going to be a true leader one day. Zoe, I know, I know I already asked you the last question, but sometimes interviewers throw curveballs. And so now I, pro- okay, now this, now I mean it. Now this will be the last question. But I've just received new information uh, that it sounds like both of your parents have been working on the front lines uh, through all of this. Your dad as a, a key member of a public transit system. Your mom is a key member of the education system. What's that been like for you uh, to have both of your parents on the front line through this pandemic? Well, it has been pretty worrisome. I mean, my dad got bronchitis about a year ago, so his lungs aren't the best <laughs> that they that compared to the average person. Um, and since he's a bus driver, he would probably be the first one of us to get COVID. So it's definitely a worry. Um, but with my mom, she... It's more stressful than worrisome with her job um, because there have been a couple cases reported in some of the classes she's taught. Um, She only has to go in person because she's a college teacher to teach labs, Um, but everything else is online, which although seems less worrisome is more stressful because she's getting a lot more work. So it's hard. I mean, I am online, so it's nice to have parents around even if only some of the time but they're not always able to help and it definitely is hard but you know I'm just (laughs) Zoe I get this I get the sense that we're going to hear from you again (laughs) I get I get this I'm going to I'm going to remember the name Zoe Cog am I pronouncing it correct is it Cogger is that how you say it yes Cogger (laughs) Zoe Zoe Cogger I think like like Eric is writing in Eric's a full-grown man he says, Zoe speaks way more eloquently than I am capable of. Mark says, young people like this young lady give me hope for the future. Uh, Sharon says, she is one smart cookie. Uh, Kim says, kids these days, absolutely amazing. Angie says, Zoe's more informed than a lot of adults, including me. Uh, she says, bravo. Jackie says, Zoe is seriously impressive. People are calling Zoe for premier. So no pressure, no pressure, my new friend. Uh, but uh, we're, we're going to keep an eye on your name and see when it starts showing up on ballots. I, I know that I need to let you both get back to your, your tasks at hand. Thank you so much for taking a break from, from your schoolwork today uh, to talk to us. You've been hearing from Zoe Cogger, who's a student uh, at Victoria School, Allison Palmer, a grade six teacher there. Uh, both of you have brightened our day. Thank you so much for this. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. What an amazing story. Okay, well, we're gonna we're we're gonna hard transition here into a, a story that's really serious business. Uh, but first, uh, want to remind you that the team at Saint Albert and Sherwood Dodge are Alberta's go-to Jeep dealers. Uh, the brand new dealership in Saint Albert. If you haven't seen it yet, I know you're gonna say, "Are you really like you think I should just like." just do a drive-by to go see a dealership yeah you should (laughs) beautiful building they've just finished it and it is chock full this 2021 jeep lineup everybody's buzzing about it jeep is coming on strong this year including the return of the full-size luxury suv the grand wagoneer talk to the teams at saint albert and sherwood dodge 
for more on that. Plus, the teams at Dairy Queen in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, proud partners, proud builders here on Real Talk, and they want your business. Mark and Michael, the owners of those six franchises, well, they've got a deal for you here. You roll in there, you, you pick up a, do- a box of six of those dilly bars, and they have dairy-free dilly bars now, by the way. What? Yeah. One box for six. You pick them up. You say, hey, I'm a, I'm a Real Talk viewer. I'm a Real Talk listener. You get a second box of six dilly bars absolutely free only at the six Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. All right. This story's making news flying under the radar maybe a little bit uh, considering the vaccine storyline, what's going on in provincial politics and, and other national and international news, of course, including Georgia down in the United States. We're keeping an eye on that. But an activist, an individual out of Edmonton that is claiming ties with the Black Lives Matter movement, he's declared himself to be a candidate seeking election in Edmonton. Edmonton's municipal election next fall is celebrating the death of a Calgary police officer on New Year's Eve. That's right. He's, uh, by way of his social media accounts, uh, laughing, saying that the officer down in Calgary, the sergeant killed on December 31st, was killed because he was a corrupted police officer. Now, I'm sure all of us are going to have strong opinions on what Abdul Hakim Dalel is saying But we wanted to hear from Black Lives Matter Edmonton, the organizers who I would imagine are eager to distance themselves from this message. Let's find out. Shima Robinson is an organizer with Black Lives Matter Edmonton. Shima, welcome to the show, and thanks for making time for us this morning. Thank you, Ryan. So let's clear this up. What's the deal with this guy? Who is he? What's his connection? What do you know about him? Uh, I personally have never met or spoken to him in my life. Uh, unfortunately, what is um, a, prob- a problem and a regular occurrence is that BLM, Black Lives Matter, BLM YEG, um, these, uh, these uh, titles, names of uh, movements or events or whatever people want to use them for are easily appropriated because it was a trending hashtag when in its inception um, because of the movement's is just very it's because it's so grassroots and so leaderful it's easily co-optable so um right now we're dealing with the situation uh i'm here to say that i i definitely have had not never had a conversation with that do hakeem at um and i've posted about it on facebook uh my team isn't even um we have no coordinated um release of information with this person. We don't, we, I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't really aware that he was running for, I wasn't really aware of him. I, I don't know. I, I, I haven't known him to be in touch with us in any particular way. Um, so yeah, that's uh, confounding and deeply troubling given a lot of factors that are now in play, which is that there will be, um, hopefully not but there might be fallout to deal with because of his uh the way he's being vocal and his his uh portrayal of uh his himself as a candidate uh in the next uh, municipal election so uh, shima uh, i uh i i won't say that i know you too well uh but you and i have spoken several times and i know you to be sincere and i know you to be a person who operates in earnest and if i can point out the obvious i feel like i can see a lot of stress and I feel like I can see emotion on your face right now. What are you feeling right now and why? I think the word is frustration. I'm feeling frustrated because the use of the specifically the term, which is, which is both on the media and on uh, Dalel himself, uh, the, the use of the term uh, black lives matter activist um, coupled with this very, very incendiary uh, type of communication strategy, uh, and as well as this uh, added announcement or intent to run for uh, municipal election or uh, as a councillor, um, or to be a councillor, uh, creates a powder keg situation locally, um, and, and not just locally. I was feeling calls a lot last night, and... Um, it's just, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's not considerate of what the effect it will have on everybody else's life. 
I think that Abdul Hakim Bilal is um, stunting, essentially, and that is really, really uh, dangerous. So, yeah, I am stressed out. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I can tell you're stressed out. Um, I uh, and it's probably not helping. I don't mean to pile this on, but I do think it's worth pointing out because I do think that that people that have public voices, um, I- including some of the, the right wing uh, or, or certainly conservative um, media outlets um, like the Western Standard, like the Post Millennial, credible or not, uh, up for debate, um, tying direct lines to this individual in your group. I would imagine I can see how that would add stress to you. Uh, it would be the same if someone were, were to make incendiary, outrageous, insensitive, horrific comments and identify themselves publicly as a, as a real talk Patreon supporter, a real talk builder, a fan of me tying themselves to my brand, tying themselves to what we're doing here. Obviously, that would be stressful, especially if, like you, I had never met this individual, had no dealings with this individual and was not connected to this individual. I mean, I'm looking at some of the coverage online right now uh, by way of these media outlets uh, who should be held accountable publicly. By the way, I'm saying this to my audience, not to you, Shima. Um, You know, they're calling, you know, there's a headline of a story released just yesterday. You know, let's call Black Lives Matter for what it is, a hate group. Uh, How does something like that make you feel i mean let's the show's called real talk let's have some real talk you have the platform now you have the microphone now what's your response to that i am not dismayed because i've heard this stuff before i think it is very important that people who are taking in media who are taking in these types of messages um and these types of claims uh have a mindfulness about how easy it is to, to co-ops. Like I was saying to co-ops the Black Lives Matter name. It's just simply, it's as simple as standing up uh, on our, or posting on your, on your Facebook or your, or your Instagram about how you're in Black Lives Matter and this is your stance. Uh, and, and if that's a violent thing, if that's uh, in this case, it is very, very, um, it's just, <sighs> It is not. It is not. It is not safe for anybody at this point who is in Black Lives Matter because of this, because of this, uh, this uh, Dalel's uh, uh, vocality. Uh, it is. It is increasing jeopardy uh, for myself and for my um, Black Lives Matter uh, group uh, group mates, teammates. Um, also, Black Lives Matter has never been a hate group. We are not a hate group locally. We are definitely struggling with serious issues of policy and how public engages with uh, the police force and, and, and the police commission. And we're struggling with uh, solidarity and building solidarity with local groups who have uh, uh, aligned goals. Um, we are working working towards increasingly inc- increasing robustness of uh of stru- structure and strategy in our own ranks like we're not we're not out here trying to trying to uh goad and rile and uh and, and hate people overtly or in any other particular way like i think a very salient quote for me that um that kind of describes what I'm talking about is uh, that just because you're for black people doesn't mean you hate everybody else. It just means that you're for black people because you're a black person and you have to be for yourself in this world on some, on, on a fundamental level. Um, so I am, I'm also very worried about uh, the um, Muslim community in Edmonton because um I had a couple conversations with a community leader from that community last night, and uh, she's very, very upset because what he's doing is actually against their cultural, uh, moral, religious creed. So um, there's a lot of feeling for me at this point behind this, um, behind this issue. Shima, I, I think, can I yeah. can I I I can see the the emotion. It, it's it's very obvious. Can, can I read some comments from some people that are watching this live right now? You want to hear some of these? Yeah. 
Uh, Mana, uh, Mana Sale, who's a very good friend of this show, um, she says she misses you and she thanks you for all your amazing work. Helen is watching and says that she would have furious tears and she wouldn't be able to maintain her composure as well as you are. Uh, Euler Country is watching and says, I feel for this person. Kim is watching and says, undermining the Black Lives Matter movement is despicable. Look at Shima's pain. My heart hurts. Uh, Sharon says she's feeling for you. Uh, uh, Shalane is watching and says this is so sad and so frustrating. And she says she sees her clot. What she describes, Shalane says her closeted racist family jump on this to diminish the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, uh, James says, I've never uh, had to have someone go to court to fight for my basic human rights. I can't imagine the absolute hell that Shima is going through right now. You have uh, incredible support right now. I want you to, f I know that this is a difficult conversation for you. It's a difficult position. Um, I suspect that you're not telling us everything uh, with regards to potentially some of the threats that you're receiving. You've implied a couple of times. I want to ask you plainly about that in a second, but I just think it's important. Sometimes I've been in these positions, but not, not the same one that you're in, but I've been positions in my life before where I feel like I'm on an Island. And every once in a while, it's pretty amazing to realize that there are a lot of people in your corner um let me ask you i i don't mean to to heap on the stress here but have you been receiving threats of violence uh, or have people connected to the black lives matter movement received threats of violence as a result of this story not yet okay uh, but my my concern part of the reason i'm here today is to help to dispel the notion that I am aligned with e either politically or strategically with Abdul Hakim Dalal uh, or anybody else in the group uh, is aligned because we're not. And um, it is uh, really important though for me to consider the safety of every black person who, who, who could ever want to claim affiliation or need the support of Black Lives Matter YEG. That's a that's that's all obviously has to be of concern uh, right now because of the the three attacks that were um, publicized uh, that were reported on um, uh, I think a month ago or so right before Christmas there were three there's a string of attacks against uh, Black Muslim uh, women and then also against um, a, a Black man in Edmonton. And um, one, the first one was uh, not deemed a hate crime, which was a, a staggering, really, because I don't understand how that could be. And it, that's something that happens every day, regardless. But the 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 there there was a there was a the trend that was suggested by the way the coverage went on, on the, of those attacks um, could be, uh, I think, powder kegging the situation if nothing is said. A hundred percent. If there's no differentiation, if there's no differentiation, I and agree so with you. I am, yeah, I'm very, very concerned for the safety of especially the youth, um, who are some of them needing to work, you know, to to support families, and um, you know, at, at this very difficult time where work is, um, you know, ex just a, on a heightened level of tension and jeopardy, if. It, I don't want anything to go wrong for them. I don't want anybody to get hurt. Um, yeah. Shima, um, there are there are multiple people right now on our on our YouTube comment thread that are simply asking, "How can we help? How can people help?" Best thing to do right now is to you can go on the. Black Lives Matter discussion page, the official discussion page for Black Lives Matter YEG on Facebook um, and share, uh, look at look at the post that I made and share it. Um, just we're trying to get the word out as fast as possible um, that this is not a coordinated strategic move of ours. Uh, this is just one person who's decided that it's okay to say that he's in Black Lives Matter and do whatever he wants about that on online and probably offline as well. And so that's, that's not okay. That's, that's, that's not the way we do things. Um, so uh, besides sharing the post, I think it's a really good idea to, to tag, uh, I think it's the, the post millennial, uh, the, the outlet that, that, that 
issued the that that, that published the article. Um, uh, tag them, um, tweet at them, uh, let them know that it's not okay to not fact check. Uh, it's not okay to, to 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 fail to fact check a story like that, and then just put it out there in the ether. It's deeply irresponsible. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I I hate I hate to give Corey Morgan the publicity, but uh, the the conservative columnist uh, for WesternStandardOnline.com also deserves to 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 feel some heat for this. Uh, Corey Morgan is the one uh, published under Derek Fildebrandt's brand at Western Standard uh, that that's calling Black Lives Matter a hate group, and and I do believe that, and, and I'm in the same position, Shima, as a public commentator i should be held accountable for what i say as a matter of fact our next interview coming up is will be me being held accountable for something i said which which i'm happy to be in that position um but but i think that that's important for our audience to recognize and understand uh, shima let me ask you this in closing and and you and i will certainly have further conversations on this show and we'll, we'll get into other subject matter but you know i, I can't help but note um, the, the first time I ever met you in person, I don't know if you remember, but you were backstage at that big rally. There was like 15 that you remember, uh, there was like 15,000 yeah. people at the Alberta legislature and there was beautiful music and incredible testimony and, and people of all ages and ethnicities and religions all masked up. And uh, I'll never forget. I mean, I have some remarkable photos from that day. I'll never forget that day. We had our little guy, we had our uh, then four-year-old down there, uh, with us because it was important for him to understand that black lives matter. And it was important for him to see uh, um, public uh, displays of, of, of priority and of demands for policy and equity and all of these things. Um, I can't help but notice, obviously, that the difference in, in, in your tone today, and it's quite understandable, um, months after that, I mean, where are we now with regards to that movement? It was remarkable. It was a global movement prompted by, obviously, horrific tragedy, uh, starting with, well, not starting with, but including the murder of George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor and others. Um, as you look back on 2020, the year that was the Black Lives Matter movement, we now look to, you know, let me say Edmonton's police service receiving a, a budget increase um, despite like three days of consultation with, with Edmonton City Council and essentially sort of a town hall format. Um, you know, Evan, Evan, I mean, there's, there's there are a lot of stories here that, that we don't necessarily have a lot of time to get into, but uh, people are taking a look at the city's anti-racism committee saying that they've been instructed to not be critical of police. Um, there are some calls from journalists that there's going to be a, a lack of, 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 of fulsome and meaningful news coverage now that uh, uh, fire and police are, are taking off radio channels that, that news outlets can monitor and that will have some implications on, on racialized communities. It's being speculated in inner city communities. There's a lot to talk about here, but the difference between that big rally and now, how are you reconciling that and, and where is your head at? I think it is um, a truism of movements that there are peaks and valleys and the in the valleys, it's not that there is no, it's not like things are dormant. It's not like there is no work to be done. In fact, there's more work to be done when you're in a valley. And so I think that there that the sorry the protest was a peak of a, a, a surge of exigence, a surge of energy that was coming out of the black community, um, and especially uh, among black youth um, and youth loosely. I'm here using youth as a definition of like 16 to 30 year olds, as per the feds, um, but. Black youth really showed up for 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 making a statement and 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 rallying the, pe the black people and the people, not just the black people alone, but the people of Edmonton, Ami Squatchy Um and um, it is it is really imperative. And right now, I think the goal for me specifically and personally, as well as organizationally in my role as uh, as uh, uh, a key member of Black Lives Matter YUG. Um, to foster a lot of support uh, internally, uh, to foster a lot of uh, strategic development, um, to foster a lot of uh, sense of direction, um, to really, despite this pandemic, try to reach out, get in touch with folks across the political spectrum, uh, try to get in touch with folks um, who can be allies? Try to get in touch with folks who can um, who can work within the within the group structure and figure out a way to move forward with uh, adaptive planning, adaptive plans. Um, because once you have a protest and the protest is done, you then have 
uh, an impetus. You have an exigence, another, a next exigence is expected of you. And so right now, because the pandemic is complicating gathering, which is usually the form of that exigence takes, uh, you know, we have to be creative and we have to, we have to also give each other a break and let each other rest. Cause we're not here to, we're not here to, to drive each other uh, into the ground uh, with, uh, with uh, a sense of, or maybe perhaps a manufactured sense of urgency, you know, like there is urgency in this world, but a big, issue uh, in movements in general from my reading on them to my experience of them has been this sense of there's no time and I think right now my whole point in coming on this show uh, is just to to give everybody a bit of a breath Uh, this is including myself and to say you know this is this is not our next move this is somebody trying to make it look like this is our next move uh, and it's not Um, so uh, yeah, so we have a lot to work on. We're continuing that work. Um, we are we're still here, um, and I do I do you know I do hope that everybody stays safe. Shima, uh, Sandra Nyo is, is is watching or listening this morning. She says my heart goes ma- my heart goes out to Shima. She says having your movement co opted. Uh, to promote hate and division is very destructive. Knowing many leaders, uh, she says, in the black and Muslim community, this is opposite to their values and actions of love and grace. It's worth mentioning, by the way, that the families, uh, at, at least one of the families that were targeted as as one of those attacks, Shima, that you mentioned earlier, I don't know if you even know this, but they're going to be speaking today. They're going to be uh, issuing a public statement today alongside Mustafa Farouk of the National Council of Canadian Muslims. Uh, we will be speaking to Mustafa tomorrow, and I'm hoping one of the family members as well. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, for our audience members, um, l- let me say, I, I, you know, let me keep it real here for a second. Speaking of, for example, Mustafa Farouk, I've had conversations with him many times uh, following, uh, you know, for example, a, a, a terror attack uh, by a Muslim extremist or an extremist. Um, and, and Mustafa and I have had had wonderful and meaningful conversations where he, he's talked about the stress that comes with being. Um, a, a practicing Muslim or, or an identifiable uh, ethnic minority at a time when an attack happens that is perpetrated by an ethnic minority, or in his case, by uh, an extremist connected to or attempting to connect to the religion. And we've had conversations around having to issue statements all the time and having to condemn the acts all the time and what comes with that. And, and if you don't condemn an attack, if you miss even one, then people will point out that you've not condemned it. Let me say that some people that are watching right now uh, listener, for example, Bernard uh, says, I've noticed and she might haven't asked you to because it wasn't necessarily relevant out of the gates. It wasn't the focus of the interview. But he says, I I've noticed that she has not condemned uh, the comments. She's not condemned the comments about the death of Sergeant Andrew Harnett. Do you have a position on the statement issued by Adul Hakim Dalal? Do you condemn the comment? Let me ask you plainly. I do condemn the comment. I, I can say that for myself. Um, I, I can't speak for every single person who's come to a Black Lives Matter protest. I can't speak for all of the people who may uh, who may identify with Black Lives Matter. But I know that for me, this action by Abdul Hakim Dalal is not only targeting this uh, uh, late officer's family, which I think is pr- a low blow. Um, it is, it, it's, it's just wrong in a lot of ways. It's capitalizing on the death of a person, a human being, uh, to, to, to popularize or to make controversial his campaign. This is how I'm reading it. Um, it's, uh, and, it just, and it just disregards any amount of caring or concern that, that, might, be, that might be expected of that is expected of a political representative, uh, especially one who would be in his position. Yeah. And- if he were, you know, like and and like and I think that it is those those things um are are across the board relevant. So it's like if Abdul Hakim Dalel had a sense of what the great responsibility of being a representative is and could uh could act on that. Uh, then there would have been, there would be, there'd be no laughing and jeering and taunting about the death of a person. 
uh, it is it is it is not our my ever my intention to to laugh and jeer and taunt when when tragedies are, are occur when tragedies are happen, um, and I think that it it's it's it really misrepresents the black community because he claims to be speaking for the black community, which I think is not true. Yeah. Um, well, I guarantee you it's not true. I mean, here, like, I guarantee you it's not true. And the, and, and the comments here indicate that your comments indicate it. Uh, the comments are deplorable, uh, quite frankly, in my mind. Uh, Shima, you know, Northside Sill points out, he says, when when like Brett Wilson and Corey Morgan unleashed their followers with hate speech, how can we be surprised that this is happening? Northside Sill says, stay strong, Shima. Before I let you go. Uh, it's worth pointing out that it, w- when we talk, when I ask you about your 2020, uh, it, it wasn't all um, necessarily directly uh, related to the Black Lives Matter movement. By association, it is, but you spent a lot of time uh, contributing to and organizing uh, Pekuiwin Camp, uh, the prominent uh, gathering in, uh, well, just south of Edmonton's downtown. People know by the ballpark there. Um, it's since been dismantled. Um, 10 weeks have passed. Uh, as, as the website indicates, the counter has reached zero on uh, Mayor Don Iveson's uh, promise to eradicate homelessness in Edmonton in 10 weeks, which was obviously very ambitious. Um, where does that movement go from here? In closing, I, I think our audience would appreciate an update. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the um, I, I, like you said, Peck and Camp is wound down and is, and is no more. Um, the uh, that that movement still requires a lot of advocacy. It still requires a continued pressure. Um, right right now, the struggles, at least at the at the end of Pekawaran camp, as it wound down, the struggle was around energy, uh, capacity, and uh, and just um, just just not having those things uh, anymore. Um, because we are we are a small group of organizers uh, at the core of the organizing team and um, it was it it was it was getting difficult. I, difficult is an understatement. It was getting astronomically astronomically like impossible. <laughs> it was just like it was very very hard to uh, to maintain, and so we had to call it. Um, and in doing so, we uh, we can see we, well. We we I, I suppose the word could be conceded to send people up the hill to the shock to not the shock conference center. Excuse me to the Edmonton uh, yeah, Convention yeah. Center. Um, the, the convention center has been running, but not uh, not as promised. We had a lot of consultation meetings with the city around how that space would be handled. It is not being handled in that way, specifically with regards to the uh, the centering of Indigenous ceremony and protocol. Uh, so that's not what's going on there right now, as per reports from people who have stayed there, and reports from people who have who are who have spoken to people who have stayed there. Um, and so that's a big problem um, because they did put up a TP in that space. And if they're going to put up a TP, it's like they shouldn't just use it as a token symbol. They should actually be using it for what it's used for. Uh, there's a lot of things like that. There's like a many a thing like that that is hard to get into with this much time left. But um, I would say that from for my part, I am I am still I, I still have my hands in a lot of different pots, uh, trying to figure out a way that we can come to. Um, policy-driven resolutions, people's issues that can actually use the great richness and, uh, and, and great capacity that we still have as a city, uh, as, a, as a municipality, as a, as a collection of communities, and as one large community to help each other and serve the greater good, the greater interests of, of people, of people who, who live in this place, Samiskachi, Waskahagan, and call it home. So that's where it's at. Shima Robinson is an organizer with Black Lives Matter Edmonton, uh, and, and I'm going to say uh, a remarkable community member. I applaud your involvement. I applaud your passion, uh, and I appreciate you coming on today to, to take this uh, head on. And you've put this on a lot of people's radar, and you've mobilized people, Shima, and I appreciate that. That's very important. Thanks for talking to us. Thank you very much, Ryan. 
We're going to be talking to uh, Leah McRory in just a second. My thanks to Shima, and please keep the comments uh, coming. First, we wanted to uh, point out that uh, the team at Park Power is the team that powers our hashtag each and every morning here on the show. Real Talk RJ is the hashtag you want to use if you want to get involved in the conversations we have. Sometimes they're light and fun and frivolous, and sometimes they're dead serious. And we appreciate Park Power making that commitment to keep that conversation moving. Park Power is in the natural gas, electricity, and internet game. And right now, as they continue their profit-sharing platform supporting charities in Alberta, they're inviting you to bring your home or business to Park Power via parkpower.ca. If you do it, and if you use the following promo code, how great is this? 2021-REALTALK. 2021-REALTALK at parkpower.ca. They're going to knock 70 bucks off your first bill. 70 bucks. How great is that? Also, a shout out, if you're going to be replacing your computer, Sounds like Alice, the teacher that joined us earlier today, Allison, could use a new computer. If you have also spilled red wine, your cat has spilled red wine on your keyboard, maybe go see Daryl and the team at Westworld Computers. They've been in the game for more than 40 years, family-owned right here in Edmonton, just off Mayfield Road. Uh, they've got all of your Apple Mac products covered. If you want to upgrade your phone, maybe you want to get those AirPod headphones, maybe you want to get a big new desktop iMac, whatever the case is, sales and service, Westworld is your go-to right here in Edmonton and across the province of Alberta. Check them out online under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Well, my thanks to our next guest for her patience. Uh, we asked uh, Leah McRory to, to join us um, at 9.30, 9.35. But obviously that conversation uh, with Shima Robinson uh, was, uh, I think, really important. Uh, Leah um, it, making her Real Talk debut this morning. And, and so I hope I haven't, I hope I haven't turned you off to the show forever by having you sit there for 20 minutes, Leah. But I know that was an important conversation for us to have. Welcome to Real Talk and thanks for making time for us today. Thank you, Ryan. And good morning, Um I'm really excited and also nervous to be here, but thank you so much for the invitation. Well, I don't want you to be nervous. Um, if anybody should be nervous, it should be me because I I, I, I am I have set myself up to take a bit of a lashing uh, because uh, and I'm and I'm saying that with sincerity um, because Leah, you know, we, we gather in community every day on this show, whether it's people watching or listening live or people that download the podcast and and we commit to real talk. And we commit to speaking plainly and speaking honestly and opening our minds and having uncomfortable conversations. And I went on a bit of a rant on Monday um, talking about provincial politics. I made a couple of comments off the cuff, unscripted, uh, in that conversation that, that I know uh, resonated in, in a really negative way uh, with with some fellow Albertans, fellow Canadians, uh, including persons with disabilities. And, um, and you took me to task and I appreciate it and I wanted to bring you here so we could talk about this so why don't I why don't I hand it over to you and I know you're more than capable to tee this up so so why don't we get the ball rolling on this conversation so uh thank you again for giving me this opportunity to uh, have this conversation with you about the language that was um used on one of the real talk shows and I and I understand um your wording to me was that you were referencing a movie um I'm not familiar with the movie as in watching it I'm familiar with that movie because it was a show uh that disabled folks had actually spoke about uh the amount of ableism in that movie and how uh, difficult it was to watch so hearing you quote um some of the ableist terms um, from uh, the movie you were quoting uh, was very difficult to hear uh, because the language, um, it was used at a time when there was widespread eugenics, uh, disabled folks uh, were forced sterilization and institutionalization. Uh, and the terms, uh, they're strong slurs against disabled people. They're offensive. And honestly, they really shouldn't be used. Rather, we're quoting um, an inappropriate movie or um, using those that language in everyday terms. They're hurtful words. Uh, People don't intend, and we know that, like I think most people uh, with disabilities know that people may not tend to be hurtful and when they unknowingly use ableist terms, but it's gonna hurt us anyway. It harms an entire community of people 
and, and not to mention the ripple effect because disability, you know, intersects with every other marginalized community. So we intersect with the black community, with the indigenous community, with the LGBT community. And so in saying that, you know, there's a lot of movies um, that have some pretty nasty language in it. And would you on Real Talk then quote some of those terms that we're using homophobic language, racist language? I don't think you would. However, it feels very comfortable for people to use ableist language that attacks a whole community of people that actually intersect with every other marginalized group. So when we do that, it's not just attacking disabled people. When you say you fight for the lives of Black people, um, you're attacking Black folks with disabilities as well, gay people that have disabilities. So when we use ableist language, it has a ripple effect in our community that expands past just the label of disability and it's hurtful. I appreciate that. Um, I, you know, some, some people are writing in and saying, what did I say? <laughs> so, so I, I, I know that you're probably going to go, Oh geez, Jesperson, you're going to say it again. But I did, I do think it's, it's, let, let me just say, let, let me say, so, so we were talking about the, the movie Zoolander and the character Will Ferrell, who says, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. And I, and I sort of exclaimed that as I was, as I was analyzing what I'm seeing in provincial politics. Let's get into some of the specific words. Let's get into some of the specific language. Leah, I've had, I've had people reach out, even when people heard that you were going to be on the show today, uh, they were excited that you're going to be here because they said that there's, there's words that we, as maybe as a general society, or at least a, the privileged element of our society, words that we may use um, w- with no harm intended, but that can be very harmful, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the, the R word for somebody that may live with a mental disability or a developmental disability. We all know that, that. I mean, those are the extreme examples. But I'm talking about someone saying something like, wow, that's crazy, or boy, that's insane. Why is yeah. that? Help us, help us understand why that's so harmful. Well, like I said, those words um, were used when there was widespread eugenics. Mm. Forced sterilization and institutionalization of people, those are very clinical terms, which um, the social model of disability uh, does not use those terms. Uh, They're ableist, they're hurtful. And, uh, you know, saying that makes people with disabilities feel lesser than, you know, less human, um, less connected, less a sense of inclusiveness and belonging. And those are all really important things that we all want in our lives to be included and to belong and to have a place that we feel those things. But when the language is constantly ableist, it's uncomfortable. It feels like you're constantly being attacked for a condition, Uh, you know, uh, rather taking crazy pills. You know, I I live with a disability. for over 20, 30 years of my life, I had this like shaking, violent shaking feeling on my insides. And I, I, I sincerely thought that everybody else lived with this too. And I never talked to anybody about it. I never shared this, this feeling because I just thought, well, everybody has this. So it's, you know, nothing really to talk about. But after years and years and and talking with my family and and saying I had this feeling and realizing nobody else in my house did, I went to see a doctor and it was really hard to hear um, that I I experience severe anxiety and that shaking feeling inside can actually be helped with a medication. And, and so I felt shame. I felt um, embarrassed, uncomfortable. I didn't want to talk about the fact that I needed a medication because there's so much shame around um, the crazy pills, if you will. And, and that keeps people from seeking help. And it keeps people um, afraid from talking about their lived experience. And, uh, and I think that that's detrimental to not only, you know, what we think and how we feel, but our own mental health every day. And hearing this language constantly, uh, rather it be on social media, in, in social gatherings, um, you can just walk down the street and this language is, is, is every day. I mean, I can't count how many times I hear people call someone else an idiot. And it is hurtful. 
And I just wish people would um, really choose words that they mean. These are filler words. They, they're filler words. It's, it's laziness and, and we can do better and we need to do better. When we talk about, um, you know, the stigmatiza stigmatization, the institutionalization of disabled people, we are the last group of people that are still being segregated and institutionalized. And this is Canada. You know, it, and, and, and the reasons why I feel like we, we never get any steps ahead or any further ahead is because of ableism. It's just, it's so accepted in our society. People think it's okay and they actually use it more often than not to make jokes. And we've seen that from President Trump. We've seen that from, um, you know, many of our politicians who have used the R word in the past that we've had to call out. And this is 2021, this isn't a new conversation. This isn't my least favorite word, awareness. We need an action. And we need people to start thinking about these things and doing these things because without the thought process of what exactly is it I'm trying to say that isn't going to offend anyone is going to make a difference in the lives of a whole lot of people that live with disabilities. Why, Language doesn't matter. Uh, um, why do you hate the word awareness? Is it, is it, what did they say? That good is the enemy of great. Is that, is that why, is that why you hate the word awareness? Awareness is my least favorite word um, in, in this community. And I think it's because we've been making people aware for so long. Sure. Um, and it's a, it's a really cheap excuse for um, a lot of people not to do what they need to do. I wasn't aware. Where's the awareness? Folks have been talking about this stuff for over 40 years. It's not a new conversation. It's just something that people are, I guess, um, not as concerned with, uh, don't understand the impact that it has on so many of us in our community. And not all disabled people are offended by um, the same language. But I will say there are a heck of a lot of us that certainly are. And um, we're just asking folks to really, you know, think about those filler words that you're using and, and express what you mean. You know, I and and we're seeing actually some some really interesting as as we're talking some some interesting conversation on our YouTube live comment thread, um, Leah, and you'll be able to view it later if you go back on the file. It sticks with the video file, so people can see what viewers were saying live as the show is recorded. Um, and and there are there are people that are that are identifying as people with disabilities. Some are saying this is so important what she's saying; these words are so important. Others are saying uh, people with disabilities saying, "Well, that." Honestly, this wasn't on my radar. That's not something that's relevant to me. And, and then, of course, we're getting pushback. Leah, I'm sure I know you to be politically engaged. I know you to be outspoken. So this isn't the first time that someone will have disagreed with you. But but there are some people as well that are saying, oh, my gosh, you know, pretty soon we're not going to be able to say anything. So, you know, there really is an interesting uh, cross section here. But but everyone's here gathered together to to participate in the conversation, which is the point. How would you respond to people that are saying, oh, my gosh, pretty soon I won't be able to say anything anymore? And we hear these things all the time. Um, and if you remember when, you know, the gay community had come out and talked about the different slurs, people said the same thing. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's just a word. It doesn't have an impact. But as people slowly got educated and took time to review the history and the impact of language, um, they understood the power behind those words and how that affected a whole community of people. And... For an example, um, you know, when we talk about the black community and language that isn't appropriate and things that we should and shouldn't be saying, um, people were upset when they couldn't use the language in the black community that they thought they should be able to use. And we are no different. The disabled community is no different than any other community, but we're always thought of as lesser than hmm. or that we're asking for something special or more. And that isn't the case. We're asking for people to be thoughtful, for some compassion, for some consideration in using filler words that you really don't need. Leah, let me let me ask you, I mean, obviously, you're, you're very politically aware, you're politically engaged. Um, what are a couple of stories? You know, this is this is an interesting time. I mean, the news had the, the news cycle is always competitive and, and it's hard to, to have issues 
forefront in people's minds and on people's radars, let alone when there's a pandemic and a global economic collapse and everything else that's going on. Um, what are a couple of, of, of issues uh, relating to persons with disabilities in, in Alberta or in Canada that you'd really like to see more coverage on, that you'd like to see more people aware of? What are a couple of the key items on your list? How much time do I have? <laughs> well, you got about five more minutes. Okay. Well, if I federally, if, if I had a, if I had a magic wand, the first thing I would do federally uh, is repatriate every single person with a disability who has been forced to live an institutionalized life. That's the first thing I would do federally. Um, provincially, I have a grocery list of things um, that are really uh, frustrating and hurting the majority of Albertans with disabilities. And that comes down to this UCP government. And uh, that comes down to the fact that we have, we were the first people that government came for. We usually are, but it was quite obvious with the UCP, how much dismay they have for the disabled community. They came for uh, PUF, for the youngest of children, which is uh, a pathway for families and children with disabilities uh, to a road of inclusion. With having funding removed from that, um, families, uh, I feel, will be steered towards a life of segregation through education. And that's scary. We have uh, the UCP government who have uh, ripped up or uh, reversed a ban on seclusion rooms in education, which means that now students with disabilities can be isolated and segregated and locked up. And we know that uh, that wouldn't be acceptable with any other child ever in education anywhere. It's abuse, but yet this government has endorsed those practices within Alberta education. So I think that's an important conversation that we need to have is why children with disabilities are being segregated and excluded in education in 2021. This would not happen with any other marginalized group, but yet here we are. And things like that language that we were talking about, ableism, that instills those beliefs in education, in society, and in the world about people with disabilities. Leah, let me ask you, Tristan uh, is watching this morning. Uh, Tristan says, I, I struggle with the word disabled. Uh, Tristan says, I have mental health issues, but it, it, it in fact, I think, makes me quite abled to succeed. It's not the case for everyone but it almost feels like sometimes like it's looking for a attention. Do you have an opinion on the use of the, I I've even seen people say you shouldn't say a, a disabled person. You should say a person with disabilities, like as one example, but, but do you have kind of a, a, a an elevator take on this? Like, do you have a, uh, do you have something yeah. you say to people on the street? Yeah. What's your name? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, uh, names matter, but, uh, uh, in actuality, you know, Tristan isn't alone. There are many folks, uh, with disabilities um, who identify differently. And it's always an important question to ask is how people identify. Personally, I'm not with my disability. We're not on a date. We're not having coffee together. Um, I have a disability. I'm disabled. And um, we're reclaiming that language, actually, because that was a language that was taken away from us. And we were given language by non-disabled people who were too uncomfortable to say the word disability or disabled and gave us other labels like we're special. Mm. We have special needs. Mm. And in fact, our needs are no different than yours. We're all interdependent. We all need each other. We all want a reason to wake up every day and belong. And, um, you know, language, I think, is self-identifying. It's important to ask people, what is your preference? And I will say, um, Hashtags are incredibly important on Twitter, as you know, and you will find many hashtags that say, hashtag, say the word disabled. Mm. We're owning it. Leah McCrory is an activist uh, living with a disability, as you heard for more than 25 years, uh, using her voice to call attention to the voices no one is hearing. You can follow her on Twitter at is no princess. Leah, first of all, thanks for holding my feet to the fire. Thanks for watching the show. And thanks for coming to join us on the show. We appreciate it. 
Have a great day, everybody. And thank you again, Ryan, for having the class to uh, to apologize, number one, because that really meant a lot to many of us. My inbox was full, and same with my Facebook messages, of people celebrating the fact that you were able to own this, which is, I'm going to say, the first. You are the first. And um, I'm trying not to, you know, cry because that, but you have no idea the impact that you've created by just opening up your show to have people listen. And um, I respect that folks don't always agree with language or, or with the ask, but if people could just entertain the thought for one minute and just look and, and, and hear from actual people living with disabilities about how this language affects their lives, and try to be the difference like you are today, Ryan. Thank you. Well, thanks, Leah. And 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 thanks for pushing us all to be better. Uh, really appreciate it. And I'll look forward to future conversations with Leah McRory. That's great. Um, that I mean, that's 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 what this is all about. Conversations like that. Conversations with Shima before Black Lives Matter. Uh, even, you know, real conversations with with the mayor and deputy mayor of Slave Lake kicking this off. All very different scenarios all very different circumstances, but these are people coming to the table saying, here is my personal perspective. I'm going to lay it all out on the table. I know not everyone will agree, but we are really endeavoring. We are pushing to be better, to be stronger as a community, to be better people, to be more thoughtful, to be more effective in our efforts. And I appreciate Leah holding my feet to the fire. I appreciate everybody that watches this show and pushes us to be better. Uh, that's great. We're going to lighten things up in just a second. Um, well, we're going to lighten them up right now because I'm just going to tell you how excited we are to be partnering with groups uh, like Friesen Brothers. Uh, these are our partners. We're going to be talking to Johnny Infamous in just a second. What a night he had last night. Didn't totally go the way he wanted as the official DJ of the World Junior Hockey Championship. But still, what a cool job. What a cool assignment he had. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to let you know that Friesen Brothers is getting set to open its 15th Alberta location. And it's going to be right here in Alberta's capital city. Uh, just off the Anthony Hende Rabbit Hill Road. It's going to transform the grocery game in South Edmonton, that's for sure. But I want to tell you about the foundation of Friesen Brothers, like what this company, this family-owned company, was built on. Over the last more than 60 years, Friesen Brothers has been committed to supporting Alberta farmers and producers. That's why they only carry fresh Alberta beef, pork, chicken, and turkey. Doesn't stop there. Their bakeries, including their famous sourdough, they only use Alberta milled flour and they support as many Alberta farmers as they possibly can in their produce department. From Red Seal chefs to real butchers and bakers, the team at Friesen Brothers has you covered for supporting local and creating delicious meals. Speaking of local, it's also a pleasure for us. We're honored to partner with the team at Local Waste Services. You know they sponsor Trash Talk. This week's edition of Trash Talk is going to be off the hook. We've got literally, literally hundreds of emails to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Really? You're I thought us, nothing happened this week. Yeah, the, the, the inbox, my inbox, went, I mean, I already have problems with my inbox, with staying on top of my inbox. I already have problems. I had it down to 200. It's at 750 now. I'm not joking. <laughs> So I guess this is also my way of saying if you've emailed me with something time sensitive, you better send me a text too because I can't even stay on top of it. People are pissed and we're going to get into an amazing edition of Trash Talk presented by Local Waste coming up later this week. You know, Local Waste has been in the waste management game for more than 25 years, family owned and operated here in the province of Alberta, and they're always looking to expand. So, I mean, hey, you could be looking to them for services, maybe your your, your commercial business. You could you, you want to change it up. You want to explore the idea of maybe getting a better deal from your waste management provider. Look to Local Waste. But hey, if you're an entrepreneur that may see an opportunity in your community, Chris Labas here is wide open to hearing about it. You can talk to him directly at 780-242-9746. He loves to talk trash. You can check out localwaste.ca. All right, let's get to this. This guy is a, a personal friend of mine. Uh, he's a colleague of mine with the Edmonton Oilers. He's the official DJ of your Edmonton Oilers. He is also the official DJ of the National Hockey League's bubble, which made him the official DJ of the Stanley Cup Finals. And he has just wrapped up his stint as the official DJ. Of, I'm having, the more fun that he reacts to this non-verbally, I might just keep going. He was the official DJ of the World Junior Hockey Championship. What a pleasure to welcome to the program DJ Johnny Infamous. 
Welcome to I the show. You, Ryan, how are you? Heck of an intro. Well, how heck are of you? an intro. I, I feel like I haven't had a chance to, aside from your incredibly generous doorstop delivery of wonderful baked goods over the holidays. You're such a thoughtful guy. Um, I haven't had a chance to see your beautiful face. Usually you and I get to hang out at Roger's place about 50 times a year. How have you been holding up? First of all, how have you been? Well, first of all, congratulations on your new venture, Ryan. It's great to hear you and see you again. And like you said, it was great to see you about, I, I think we're about 30 feet away from each other when I dropped off those uh, Christmas gifts to you. But uh, it's just been inc an incredible five or six months for me. And it, it's hard to say that with everything going on with everyone. I know everyone's suffering right now. Everyone's going through anxiety and uncertainty, but uh, uh, some good things uh, came out of it. Uh, for Rogers Place, uh, for for Edmonton, for Alberta in general, all these amazing events coming here. Uh, it, it's really sad and, and so surreal. I keep telling people that it's 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 crazy to be involved in these events that are on such like a world international scale, and uh, to look down and see nobody in the stands, okay, and to not see Ryan Jesperson out there, you know, with his mic revving up the crowd, to not see. Hunter banging on the drum to not hear jazz, you know, on the organ. It's 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 just a very surreal experience. So uh, there's positives and negatives, and I'm just trying to trying to uh, you know uh, navigate through them all. Can I can I know I, I have such anxiety from the low battery light that is flashing on your screen right now. Are we about to lose you? There's no there, there's like a low battery light that's flashing at the top of your screen. And I'm paranoid that I'm going to lose you mid sentence. You're all good. You're all powered up. I don't, I don't think I don't think you'll lose me. OK, we're good. <laughs> good. So so <laughs> you have I, I have I have a lot of questions because I want to ask you about I mean, obviously, you know, you, you do an amazing job. You've been you've actually been recognized uh, league wide in the National Hockey League. Uh, I've even seen from, from within Madison Square Garden Network, MSG Network for for the job that you do for the Oilers. Um, but I want to talk to you about two different things. You're 2020, like you said, very unique. Unique. You had the the very unique opportunity to 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 DJ to handle the music and the atmosphere for literally. Correct me if I'm wrong, but literally every game that was played in the National Hockey League bubble in Edmonton, which is wild if you consider how many games that is. You were doing four games a day at some point, right? But you've also you've also just wrapped up the, the World Juniors as well. You you were tasked, Johnny, which is why we wanted to talk to you. I, I mean, we could talk to a hockey coach or we could talk to what happened last night. Canada loses 2-1 to the Americans and we could talk some hockey. But how fascinating to have a chance to talk to somebody that was tasked with creating an atmosphere to get the players ramped up and ready to compete for the ultimate prize with nobody in the stands. How did you approach the assignment? As I said, that, that, as you're talking about it, it just it's so surreal going to work every day. And you know, it's just you and 10 guys on the eighth floor, uh, <laughs> men and women who are just trying to put this thing together. But uh, the first, uh, I know it's cliche to say, but teamwork. I went out, I reached out to every DJ I could. Uh, I'd like to shout out a few DJ Joe Green from uh, Las Vegas, Jake Wagner. They're a music director. Uh, you know, Dallas Stars, Michael Gruber. He's one of the best DJs in the league. Incredibly creative in situational music and stuff like that. And I just went to every team and said, hey, send me some music. How can we make this feel like your hometown, like your home arena and, and started from there. And then, you know, myself along with uh, Lindsay got it, gullet rather, <laughs> he's going to kill me for uh, <laughs> messing up. Say. Lindsay gullet, uh, the game uh, presentation manager. We, we just went through everything and just kind of cut the fat, like what's going to hit home for people watching the TV. Uh, and then along with John Beccaro, uh, the director of the NHL and uh, Steve Mayer, the uh, creative content officer, uh, we just, we just, kind of tried to trim everything down and try to say, Hey, what's going to make people sitting on the couch at home feel like they're in the arena, even though we can't possibly get there 100%, you know, and Lindsay Gullet uh, deserves a shout out. He's, he's the, I don't know what his actual name. I think he's like di director of uh, game presentation or something like that is his title. But when I try to explain it to people, um, when, when you and I are, when you and I are working national hockey league games, I'm the in game host. I'm the guy up on the jumbotron. You're the guy spinning the tunes. Um, I always say to people, Lindsay's the guy in both of our ears. Lindsay's the, he's, yeah. he's the conductor of the symphony that is the in game presentation. So so he deserves was, a ton of credit. 
I was just going to say, you know, he's one of those guys in the thankless positions there. He is the maestro. Yeah. He's the guy cueing everyone from video replay to lighting to music. And, uh, you know, it's just that's another thing. You know, I, I get a lot of the limelight. I get a lot of, you know, the tweets. But really, I'm just one small part. There's so many people working behind the scenes from the ice crew to the lighting to the soundboard uh, to Lindsay and the other uh, professionals kind of directing everyone else. This was really just it was a big eye opener for me on just how how many people it takes uh, to get one of those beautiful broadcasts uh, that you love to sit down and watch on your couch every night on air. I didn't realize, and I mean, I, sh- I shouldn't have put it past you because I know how, how dedicated you are to your craft. I didn't realize you'd actually been consulting with DJs from other NHL teams to make sure those players were hearing the music that they were familiar with. Is there like a, is there like a little uh, 31 team is, is Seattle's 32, right? I think 32 teams yeah. now in the national. So are you, are, is there like a, a little group of, uh, do you have like a group chat or something of 32 NHL DJs? Everyone asks me this. There is, there's a secret group on really? Facebook and it's, it's not just Johnny. I told you, <laughs> I told you. Change that. Well, on. we still have, we still have your audio, which is hold great. On, hold on. Okay, hold yeah, on. no, we'll hold on. We, I can hold on. That's fine. We can, you know. I mean, you know, I'll tell you this. This is the most unprepared I've ever seen Johnny Infamous. The guy is Johnny on the spot <laughs> any other time, and now he knows he can't defend himself. So I can just take shots at him until he gets back and changes his battery pack. But honestly, I love this from Brad. Um, we, we're getting a lot of questions here from Oilers uh, fans. Uh, Greg here says, "What a fun job." Um, April is wondering if players ever request certain. By the way, before I go any further, that this is the universe putting April in front of me. April Prescott was on the show before. You remember her? She's the one. Uh, Sam, we were so inspired by April. She's the one that does all the artwork, uh, honoring like frontline workers, doctors, physicians. She she go. did that amazing art of John Mark Earl. No, Johnny, now you got to wait because now I'm off on a tangent. I'll be back in 20 minutes. <laughs> um, but April did the John Mark Earl painting, the guy that did the ice bath. with. The, anyway, so April's like solidified herself in the early stages of this community forming uh, as a good friend of the show. She's the one that put our guests on the radar with uh, Allison, the teacher from from Victoria School and Zoe, the grade six student, that was from April. So a shout out to April for putting that on our radar. Um, Johnny, we're getting we're getting a ton of uh, questions for people that just want to kind of pick your brain on on what you do um, with the Oilers. We'll talk about the Stanley Cup final, and of course, I want to ask you about the World Juniors last night. But Brad says, "Hey, Johnny, I'm an, a, another local DJ here." He says, "What's your favorite song to play at Oilers games when there are fans <laughs> there?" I, I mean, me and again, uh, shout out to Lindsay Gullet. We, ha- we have a favorite for Puck Drop and that's Wolf Mother's Joker and the Thief. We just love it just as a classic tune. But uh, in general, like you were just asking about player requests and stuff like that. You know, hockey, you've got such a, a broad uh, kind of uh, so many opinions on music, not only from the players and the fans and the coaches and the staff that, you know, sometimes I just like to play a banging beat. And that's what I call it. Just something EDM, something high tempo before puck drop, because it's going to kind of connect with everyone. You know, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a bland, just overview of, of a pump up is, is what I call it. But uh, yeah, I like to go back to the classics. I mean, you can't, it never hurts to break out some Ozzy Osbourne, to break out some Thunderstruck, to to break out uh, some of those uh, classic bangers that, uh, you know, we're around in the Gretzky days. So. Yeah, no, and, and and it's like, I won't say it's funny for me, but sometimes it's nice for w- w- like when the haters will take a break from hating on me to start hating on you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sometimes I think this poor guy, because I've seen you work uh, sometimes when we were allowed to gather a little more closely, sometimes you've let me hang out up on uh, in, in on your perch there, which is like the coolest spot in the whole rink. You've got an amazing vantage point. Um, isn't it weird to imagine, Johnny, how we used to have 18,500 people and we could all gather together and I could put my arm around you and hang out, but I've seen you work and I know how much you put into it and how seriously you take it. But some people, you just can't make them happy, right? Like you're, you're, you're going to put some drum and bass to some EDM. The classic rock lovers are going to hate it. You're going to play some classic rock. Some of the younger people might hate it. I mean, it's just one of those things where you got to, I guess, just roll with it. I mean, in this day and age, especially, I mean, every move you make in an arena with close to 20,000 people, yeah. there's going to be someone that doesn't like it. But I, I always say the same thing to Lindsay. It's it's like when I play a corporate event or a large wedding or something like that. Every song you play, you're going to lose four people from the dance floor and you might gain, you know, six or you might lose 10 and you might gain 20. Uh, every song you play, I'm 
just trying to be as broad as I can. I, you know, I, uh, I had a friend once that told me, you know, if I ever go to a hockey game and don't hear, we will rock you and paid for a ticket, I feel cheated. Yeah. And I always keep that in the back of my mind. You know, you think these funny staples that are kind of cheesy that you'd hear in a stadium don't mean anything to anyone. And they mean a lot to that person who's there for the first time. Absolutely. Or that person who hasn't experienced Alberta or Edmonton or Rogers Place or a big Saturday night hockey game. So, I, you know, I try to, I've got a thick skin too. I've been doing this for a number of years now. So I, I've, I've taken the bad with the good. And you've seen like this uh, just gave a wider scope, you know, so many eyes all over the world through the uh, the NHL playoffs and, and now the world juniors. And it really gave me a lot more uh, confidence because it really opened the scope and showed me that, you know, the majority of people are loving what we do here in Edmonton are loving what I do what the game presentation crew are putting together. And uh, you know, those haters are, are very small, you know, on Twitter, they're like this big. Oh, buddy! I mean, Brian Hall. Uh, for those that don't know, Br- Halsey is a is a is a literal uh, Hall of Fame broadcaster here in Edmonton. He's he's into his mid eighties, and he's uh, he's just got a career that's uh, just incredible and uh, a pure class act and a good personal friend of mine. And I asked Halsey once for some good advice, Johnny. I said, "What's the, what's the best piece of advice you can give me as a talk show host?" And he said, "Make sure they love you." or hate you. And that was his <laughs> advice to me. So, uh, well, I mean, if, if they hate you, they're still talking, they're about still you, right? talking That's about what you, man. I've learned is, yeah. You don't respond. And it's, it's still your name out there. So. Hey man, the worst, the, wor- mean, the worst, the worst thing that can happen is that they stop talking about you. So, so there you go. Yeah, exactly. let, let me ask you about this. You had a, I'm saying this in a fun way. Um, you had a bit of a hater, Sam, let's tee this one up here. You, you had a bit of a hater, uh, what? by way of 400 plus goal scorer, Ray Ferraro, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Gordon Miller's color guy, uh, in the broadcast. I, I get it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, real talk audience. You got to listen closely to this. Then Johnny will get you to tell the story after the fact, what exactly happened here. Is going I knew this was going to four nothing here in the second period. Oh no, there's that music. Where did they find that? I thought you took care of that. Russia might have probably holding. We need to have a word with who? I don't know. We need to have a word. Let me just say to the person that just played that music, Ray Ferraro will hunt you down and find you. That was something. Okay. <laughs> Ray Ferraro is going to hunt you down and find you. What's the story for people that have no idea what's going on? So uh, for people that don't know, last year's World Juniors, they played the same penalty song for every penalty. And we thought it was a joke the first game, the second game. the third. It happened every single penalty, uh, whether it was a home team or against. And uh, it's a song called Charlie. It's kind of like a, you can picture like six clowns in a car coming out. It's kind of like doop, 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 doop. and uh, Ray Ferraro, he, he was very vocal about his opposition to this music. So this year, you know, we kind of wanted to pay homage to last year. Uh, we didn't want to become annoying. We wanted to do our own thing, but we sat on it. We saved it. We were going to save it for gold medal game. But uh, when Russia took a penalty uh, the night before, we, we said, you know, we got to throw it in here. We've got we've got a moment. We've got people's ear. And when we did, uh, we knew we were looking over. We were looking over the ledge at, at Ray. And uh, <laughs> so you're specifically you were specifically trolling Ray Ferraro. <laughs> I, 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 so how, I how mean, often- it's. You, you people, it's, it's people love trolling. it by the way. People, love, oh, of course it's trolling, it, but it's not I in mean, a bad it way. Is, it is, but honestly, Ray Ferraro is one of my one of my favorite broadcasters. Ray's it's amazing, a, the most favorite guy for me uh, to call a game. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's just, we're trying to have fun in there. You know? Yeah, no, I, let me say Ray Ferraro is not, I, I, I don't, there's not time for me to tell the story, but, but I once got to attend a grown man sleepover with Ray Ferraro. Sam's never <laughs> literally like in sleeping bags on couches. And we stayed up until three in the morning. Like we were five years old and Ray Ferraro just told stories about his NHL career the whole time. Ray Ferraro is a beauty. Um, so yeah. I just, I just thought that was so hilarious, but, but I also, it made me wonder how, how often do you have a little, like, is it once a game, twice a game, once a month that you have a, a little inside joke? That's maybe only funny to even just you, or maybe it's funny to a player on the bench or maybe you're trolling an opposite. How often does that happen? I mean, you wait for those chances, right? And that's what I've learned over six years with the Oilers is that, you know, when I came into this, you know, I'd come from uh, actually uh, DJing soccer games, lacrosse games, things like that kind of worked my way up uh, to hockey. And, uh, you know, originally I was just of the thinking that, you know, a song's a song. Don't think too much into it. If it's pumping, it's pumping. If it's not, it's not. Don't listen to the lyrics. And now, you know, you're searching for those gold gems. You're, and, and when you find them, you don't want to, 
shoot them from the hip too quick. You want to save them because when you hit them at those perfect moments, you know, you can see now the world takes notice. So, and, and over this course of the playoffs, uh, working with John Beccaro and Steve Mayer, the CCO of the NHL, I have to shout him out again. He is an incredible mind for just how broadcasting and event delivery should be done. And not only that, just the music, he was the guy who, you know, I have to give him 50% of the credit. A lot of those songs we played in situational moments were where we both had ideas. He'd fly something out. I'd say, well, why not this? He'd say uh, another song. He, he just, he had this mind of the situational music that I'd never tapped into before. So I really, over this course of these two tournaments have just grown in that way. Um, but again, you know, there's a time to be serious, right. About hockey. There's a time to, you know, get away from the funny stuff, but every now and then, if you can get that little nugget of gold of people just going crazy. Well, saying, yeah, and, right? But you're, you're right though, Johnny, you've just, you've nailed it too. Like there's, there's, there's room for like fun and, and, and sort of frivolity, if you will, sort of a frivolous approach to it. But but there's also times where it's like everybody's on the edge of their seats. And, and if you play the wrong song, people will pile on you. Uh, and, well, let and- me tell you a story. <laughs> oh, please do. <laughs> and I've never talked about it publicly, but I did. I did play, uh, you know, I remember it was late in the game and uh, the Oilers were down by one. And uh, uh, there was three quick puck drops after one another. So I played a pumper. It was icing. They went back to the other end. I played another pumper. Icing again, they go back to the other end. And I remember thinking, I don't want to inundate the players with this just banging over and over. So I, I hit my clap tracks uh, folder, which is full of songs that just start off with clapping or drum beats. And, you know, Jack and Diane came on. And this was the time the I got the most ripped apart on Twitter and everyone went insane. Well, because Who like plays- because like media members started like Dustin Nielsen from TSN 1260, yeah. who's a personal friend, <laughs> uh, but but he piled on. He, he sicked his followers onto you. Yeah. Yeah. And this was a moment where, you know, it was late in the game and I didn't expect three pumpers to happen in a row. So I just hit the clap track. And, and, you know, that was just one in a bucket that starts off with a little bit of a clap. So but I mean, that's the thing I've learned over time is. Is just you know you can either hit or you can miss really easily. Yeah, oh, but, but <laughs> I also mean, I mean Jack and Diane, great tune, Maybe, amazing tune, amazing any other tune point in the game. Yeah, at any other point in the game, fine, amazing tune. Uh, just maybe yeah. not right then. Um, we've got some great questions here for Johnny. I know you got to get moving. We got to get moving too. But Brian wonders. Here's something like get some insight. I mean, one of the, one of the real shit moments of 2020 was was the passing of of legendary Edmontonian, a legendary member of the Edmonton football team's family, the Edmonton Oilers family, uh, Joey Moss. And uh, Brian wonders what are the chances we'll hear La Bamba. Um, he says as the goal song, but he's what are the chances we'll hear La Bamba this year in honor of Joey Moss? I would imagine you put some thought into. Stuff like that, tributes and, and meaningful moments. Oh, we definitely do. I mean, the first whistle in the first Canada game in the World Juniors, uh, we paid tribute to Joey, and it was just uh, by playing the bomba. And it's just like uh, you know, it's like someone ripped our heart out that day when uh, we lost him. But uh, you know, those kind of decisions kind of happen up here. You know, I kind of send an email up the chain, right? So I'm not sure if that will happen, but uh, you know, that's definitely a staple song that uh, we're going to have in our repertoire uh, for years to come now. Yeah. Jason says a uh, shout out to Johnny for playing. Is it Mercules? Is that right? He says, uh, <laughs> m- you know who that is music. He says during these huge hockey games, way to support Canadian hip hop. Uh, y- that's you have- another thing I like to do is yeah. reach out. Well, you have Canadian a- artists. What a platform, right? Yeah. And just that's what I did last night. You know, I reached out to Merck and just said, hey, do you have anything new and clean that I can uh, play in the game? But I like I like to hit up all sorts of uh, Canadian artists on social media. And and uh, that's what I was trying to do throughout uh, the playoffs and, and the World Juniors, which just kind of put a hometown spin and a home country spin on the music. Uh, yeah. Eric, uh, is it Eris uh, Estrada is wondering, do hockey games ever get Rickrolled, uh, which, <laughs> which is an amazing question. Oh, it's in there. It's in the library. It's in the we'll library for you this year. Hey, are you? Um, I, I haven't. I haven't had a chance to. To you and I haven't. Had, we used to hang out all the time, and we will again. But but I haven't. Um, I know a big part, like sort of back in the day of what you did was was like DJing weddings and and corporate parties and things like that too. Um, did you get kicked in the teeth as bad as everybody else in in events uh, in the last year? I mean. Oh, definitely. There's no events right now. And that's something where, you know, it was a decision where I could either do very small events or, or just stay safe and stay at home. And that was a decision I kind of made me and my wife kind of made was, you know, like it's either one or the other right now. Um, uh, So, you know, but uh, clients have been great. 
clients have been very understanding and I'm being very understanding as well. I'm sure a lot of event entrepreneurs are doing the same right now and just yeah. everyone's, everyone's got their fingers crossed for 2021, 22 <sighs> to, to have their big day. Right. So yeah, I had, it, it was, it was like uh, the collapse. I'll never forget the, uh, it was about a 36 or 48 hour period uh, right around, right around March 12th, March 13th, where it was just, uh, every time I would check my phone, there'd be three more events canceled. And it was just like, mm. Oh boy. Like that, that was kind of the wake up call, what this was going to look like. Uh, infamous, uh, you know, I'm, I'm your biggest fan, man. I'm so glad you're here on the show. Sam producer, Sam has a, a question for you. And I wanted to uh, sure. just get Sam to tee it up. Um, he, Sam is like being so like following protocol. He texted me. He said, could you ask Johnny this question? No, you ask him that. What, what did you want? Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't want to ever just butt in. Hey, Johnny, how's it going? <laughs> Come no, on in. Hey, uh, Sam. Yeah, no. Hey, I'm curious. Cause like, um, you know, we talk about the, the sports that we have here prominently in Edmonton, particularly the Oilers and the football club, you know, we know what that mm. stadium atmosphere is like. I'm curious what you have to say about other sports where, um, you know, the music has like real meaning. Like I'm thinking about the walk-up music in baseball. I'm thinking about mm. how in basketball, the home team gets to set the music and they use it to sort of mm -hmm. throw off the opposing team. Like what would it yeah. be like doing one of those for you? Have you ever done a game like that before? Like, or what, even, what you... even Sam, like yeah. uh, in the NBA and in lacrosse when they, they can play music during play. Yeah. That's what I meant. It's like mm -hmm. music yeah. is constantly in basketball. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm kind of uh, in my zone right now with hockey. I mean, I look at, you know, for example, four corners, uh, a good guy out in Toronto. I talk to often of uh, DJ for the Toronto Raptors. I mean, that's a whole different ball game. You're talking about playing uh, in game oh, yeah. music yeah. all the time. And like you said, trying to mess with the other team. So I, I like where I am right now. It's somewhere I'd love to branch out and do other things. But like I said, I came from lacrosse. Uh, here in Edmonton before it left, where it, it was the same thing, it, music all through gameplay, right? Um, and it's just, they're all different animals. And believe me, everyone uh, is an expert in their field. Like you just talked about baseball, uh, DJ Groups, uh, Michael Gruber from the Dallas Stars, who I also talk very close with all the time, an excellent creative mind uh, with music in-game presentation. Uh, he just left the Dallas Stars uh, to go to his dream job at the Texas Rangers, which is, Ooh. he's that, he's that situational guy, right? He, he likes doing those walkouts and doing those bang on situational songs all the time. So yeah, they're all different animals, but I, I think I'm, I'm in a good fit here. I'm picturing Charlie Sheen, uh, in major league right now, walking from, <laughs> walking from the bullpen to the pitcher's mound. Uh, yeah. I love anyway, that movie. Oh, amazing movie. Infamous, uh, I'm just, what can I say, man? I'm so proud of you and what you've been doing. And, and, and you're one of, you like you said it yourself. You're one, you're one of my friends that has, um, cause I know you to be a thoughtful and a, and a sensitive guy that, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of going, you're downplaying the, yeah, no, careful. I'm not going to get too, you know, but I'm not going to pump your tires too I'm full here, serious. pal. Um, <laughs> But it's been a great year for you in the sense that you've had a lot of work, you've had a lot of opportunity, and, and I know that you've been sensitive around that because it's been a difficult year for a lot of people. But let me just say, as someone who's been watching from the sidelines, someone who's typically accustomed to working with you, I'm so proud of what you've been doing. You've been killing it. And I'm so glad you shouted out to, to Lindsey Gullett and everybody else that's done an amazing job. The Oilers Entertainment Group family through the uh, Stanley Cup playoff bubble and then the World Junior Hockey Championship, uh, the entire province, the entire country should be proud of them for that. And you've been a big part of it. Yeah. And I just, I just want to thank everyone. Like, like you said, it's hard to be happy when so many people are facing all this uncertainty and anxiety right now. And so, yeah, I have tried to try to dim it down, but you know, I just want to thank everybody for the support, uh, you know, congratulate you, Ryan. And as well, uh, Michael Bobroff, you know, him well down there at VPCR uh, yeah. told me to shout you out and said, uh, he can't wait till we get the band back together. And by the band, I mean, jazzy organist, Hunter, you, myself, the Oilers drum and bass crew, uh, before, drum and brass crew, rather. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's not the same without you guys, the fans inside uh, the big barn. So hopefully uh, this thing's over sooner than later and uh, we can see you all sometime yeah. soon. Yeah, brother. Uh, hey, a shout back right out to Michael Bobroff. It's on my to-do list to get in touch with him. I'll just say it publicly. Uh, Bobroff, yeah. just, I just noticed a couple days ago, signed up uh, to be one of our Patreon supporters nice. and, that, and that just means the world to me. I've so, worked with him too. He's a is, good guy. Oh, he's a yeah. great dude and I'm so grateful for that support. Amazing. Um, and a shout out, a shout out to Team Canada as well. Like, yeah. if, if not for the loss last night, but potentially one of the greatest Canadian world junior teams ever. I mean, uh, the records they were setting with, you know, goaltending minutes and, and uh, you know, the five on five record, it was just, 
but that's that's talky these days. I've learned over the last six years. Like, I mean, any night of the week, it's any team's game. I yeah. mean, it's so fast. Players are at such at the top of their game, even at a young age the, these days. It's just, you know, but uh, the way uh, they stepped up, you know, Dylan uh, and uh, it took a uh, yeah, Cousins was Kirby amazing. And, yeah. Oh, <laughs> and that, that, Kirby, that scoring that, race between him and Zegers was just. And you have awesome. to, I mean, I know that this isn't a, a productive or fruitful or healthy exercise, but you know, if, if, if woulda, coulda, shoulda, but if we would have had Kirby doc playing too, you, you, I mean, the guy's already a national hockey league star. He's not even 20 yet. Um, yeah. Maybe would have been different, but, but Hey, Amazing. infamous, let, but you don't want to take away from the Americans though. Like that. <laughs> great. Good. They, they play I mean, great. And I, and let me just say this um, two things. Um, I do have American goaltender Spencer Knight in my hockey pool. Um <laughs> And so I, I was kind of like, and I, I was kind of like, oh, he is, he is pretty good. He's pretty darn good. <laughs> so, so, and then also, and I, and maybe I'm just trying to trick myself, um, because I was with everybody else last night wearing my Jersey, feeling frustrated as, as team Canada, you know, the goalies pulled and they're trying to score and, and they're doing everything they can. And it just wasn't their night. Um, but they will be back motivated to avenge this loss next year when we can all be in the stands. Right? And that's the, that's the thing I was thinking when it all came to a close, it was heartbreaking standing there with Lindsay up in game press, just watching uh, the last minute, you know, but uh, an amazing group of guys. And yeah, that's the big dream is next year, the deafening sound as, uh, as they said on TV of, of the crowd that was just missing this year. I can't wait to see fans in the building again. Love you infamous. We'll talk to you soon, pal. Ryan, all the best. Congrats. Yeah, you got it. That's DJ Johnny infamous, obviously a, a total class act, a good friend of mine, the official DJ of your Edmonton Oilers, the official DJ of the 2020 NHL Stanley cup playoffs, the Stanley cup finals and the 2020 world junior hockey championship. That's an incredible addition to the resume. Um, Sam, we've gone uh, overtime, if that's even a thing anymore. Um, <laughs> we're sort of. I think we've started to say overtime starts at two over, hours. Overtime now. starts at. 10:30. I, I was going to show you, like, you know, it's a good show when I can't read my own writing. Did, like, did, does our audience know yeah. that you? I don't know if our audience knows that you keep notes through the show. So it's. it's I have it, seven pages today. I he's think got this seven the first show where I've gone notes. to seven pages. Well, I love this because Shirley chimes in and she says, "What an emotional ride this morning! What an no amazing kidding. smorgasbord of guests." Now, let me just say, um, we brought you, uh, I, I think, pretty in-depth and excellent coverage. I, I don't mean that how it sounds. Like, we brought you excellent coverage. What I mean is that the guests were excellent. Um, when we had the mayor, deputy mayor from the town of Slave Lake, feels like an eternity ago. It was more than two hours ago that we talked to them about calling for the resignation of Pat Rain. We've talked about uh, accusations from uh, right-wing media sources uh, claiming that an outlier, an individual making despicable comments about the death of uh, Calgary Police Sergeant Harnett uh, tying himself to Black Lives Matter movement. We checked in with Shima Robinson, an organizer with Black Lives Matter. We talked about ableist language with Leah McRory. We learned about the visit, a virtual Zoom visit of the Prime Minister to a, a local elementary school's classroom. We talked to Johnny Infamous. We've, we've covered a lot of ground. We have not even really... Uh, in depth, I mean, I've touched on the stories, but we've not even really talked about th the predicament, the conundrum, the real, the very real problem that Calgary's mayor Ned Nenshi finds himself in with uh, the the revelation that his chief of staff traveled, with, uh, a chief of staff and another junior staffer both traveled to Hawaii over the break. Uh, that's a real problem for Calgary's mayor, uh, who says there won't be sanctions. I would suspect he might walk that back. I I don't know how you can go no punishment on that one, considering uh, what the public expects. Uh, right now, I will let you know that Premier, uh, rather uh, Mayor Nehed Nenshi uh, is confirmed to be with us here on Real Talk Friday at nine in the morning as part of a mayor's roundtable. Uh, we're going to be hearing from uh, probably it looks like four Alberta mayors on Friday morning. He will be one of them. And we will obviously be asking him about that. We'll be talking to him about the Green Line, the LRT project, as well as as well as something else, which is embargoed information. In other words, not ours to share until it's announced. So uh, we'll look forward to that conversation. And we didn't even really talk on at all uh conservative leader Aaron O'Toole's uh, statement yesterday let me just get like, to this we haven't done any news today <laughs> we, like, I know, been I, so packed I blew through the newscasts yeah. oh, uh, which is you know kind of I mean when you were listing all the stuff that we talked about today like I kind of was just going in my head and just like yeah it's just a Wednesday at real talk like, yeah no big deal like that's that's what we do around you know here. so you know uh, yeah I mean here's let, 
let me, let me read. So, I, so typically in our news, I'll just have bullet points and then I kind of riff off those. And, and so here were today's basically Slave Lake Council demands resignation of its MLA. Oh, I like it. You give me the news music. We'll do the newscast at 1048 in the morning. I love it. I love it. So Slave Lakes Council unanimously telling their MLA to beat it. He says he's not going anywhere. That's a developing story. That's not the end of that. Trust me. Uh, my, my point here says Mayor Nenshi staffers went to Hawaii. Yikes. Uh, that's another one. Uh, Georgia results. It looks like uh, the Democrats are trending in the direction they want. Uh, and this is one we'll be keeping an eye on through the day. It's far from done yet. And then, of course, why don't, why don't we bring up why don't we bring this up? We talked to I didn't even ask infamous about this, but the world junior 50 50. Did you see this? Did anybody see this? This is wild. Someone and I haven't even I haven't checked since we went on the air, but as of 830 this morning, I don't believe it was claimed someone in Alberta is going to win a 17 and a half million dollar. I was talking to my friend Jenny. She said, I thought that there was a she said, I thought the combo was in the wrong place. A $17.5 million 50-50 jackpot as part of the World Junior Hockey Championship. Uh, if you're wondering if it's your ticket, make sure you check out HockeyCanada.ca. Uh, but I was going to say, we didn't even talk about uh, conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. This can be in the headlines as well. Um, uh, yesterday, uh, stating, uh, referencing a story uh, that uh, reported by CTV News in Ottawa that federal inmates are set to receive COVID-19 vaccinations starting Friday. Aaron O'Toole tweets, not one criminal should be vaccinated ahead of any vulnerable Canadian or any frontline health worker my response to that when i tweeted it out was was, i didn't even take a position on it. i just said oh boy here we go because i know that this is the type of statement that's going to get people going some folks are going to say damn straight you know as far as i'm concerned they shouldn't get the vaccination at all right they shouldn't have any rights at all you know some people are going to will invoke discussion about capital punishment others on the other side of the spectrum will say whoa 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 you know, uh, a society is, is measured by how it treats the elderly and the incarcerated, right? Let, let's let's have a little... You know, other people will quite rightfully say, what about the frontline workers in the jails? What about the guards? What about the staff? What about their protection? And there's a lot to get into here, and, and we'll take that on. Uh, it's not a top priority story as, as far as I'm concerned here, uh, but if you do have an opinion on it, we would love to hear from you again. Uh, before we say goodbye, I want to recognize more of our partners that have just done an amazing job helping us build Real Talk to where it is uh, right now, uh, less than two months uh, since launch. We wouldn't be where we are without the team at Alta Moving and Storage, a locally owned and locally operated operating business that wants to make one of life's most stressful experiences moving much less stressful. This is the team that invites you to simply reach out to them, tell them your circumstance, and let them work with you to develop the perfect solution. So whether it's getting those frog boxes, those eco-friendly moving boxes, or or whether it's their bread and butter, these pod-style moving containers that they drop off at your house and then transport to the new destination, or whether it's Short or longer term storage solutions, the team at Alta Storage has you covered. You can uh, certainly give them a call. Uh, They want to take your call or you can visit them online. The number to call 780-993-ALTA and you can find them at altastorage.ca. We're also, as you know, very grateful for the team at Clean Air Club. We asked them to audit our space. They did that and they've given us measures to breathe easier here in the studio and they want to do the same for you in your home. It starts with your furnace filter. And then what they do is next day delivery in most cases of the perfect furnace filter. You tell them the size you need at cleanairclub.ca. They do the rest. And so you make sure that your furnace filter is replaced when it should be so your family can breathe easy and you can save money and we're also very excited this january in 2021 to welcome the team at eden landscaping into the family of builders here at real talk it's never too early to start designing your dream outdoor space and this is what they do so we're going to be learning more about what eden landscaping does one of the things i can tell you for sure that would be appealing to me as a potential customer you don't have to hire a landscape architect and then head over to Eden. You don't have to pay two professionals. They do the design with you. They then implement that plan working within your budget, and they've done some pretty spectacular stuff. If you'd like to contact the Eden Landscaping team, I mean, geez, what do you have, like an inch of snow in the province over the last month? People are going to start heading outdoors. It's beautiful and mild right now. Maybe you're watching or streaming from your backyard right now. I don't know. Eden Landscaping is under the sponsors link at ryanjesperson.com. Heck of a show, Sam Brooks. 
heck of a show. We'll be back at it tomorrow. Uh, we've already confirmed some guests, and uh, I can tell you that Frank Graves is going to join us. He's a pollster that's already predicted two years out that Rachel Notley's winning the next Alberta election. We'll ask him why. Plus, we'll get to your vaccine questions and plenty of talk time to read the letters you're sending us. You're demanding it. We'll talk to you at 8.30 Mountain Time Thursday morning.